Okay. Um, so this is data conservation in action and getting engaging the community in the data at risk data commons. And um, this is the, our agenda for this morning or this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are. And um, I'm talking uh, at the moment about what is data at risk.org and what are the goals that we have for this session. And I note that the goals for the session fall into two parts, goals for participants and goals for the organizers. In other words, Denise, I, Katie, et cetera. And then we'll talk a little bit about roles. Oops, that's going the wrong direction. Um, no, it's not. So what is data at risk? The at risk data commons is a website and an associated organization uh, that'll be nonprofit that is its purpose is to connect people with data at risk to volunteers, data experts, and additional resources. If you want to think of it as a match.com for data at risk and orphaned or surrender data, that, that would be a reasonable thing to do. Um, and in fact, that's exactly how this started at an IMLS funded workshop on uh, data rescue toolkits, um, where I had um, the idea that really the issue is, is that there are a lot of volunteers who are willing to actually help with data rescue type tasks. But in order to do that work, they actually need to have some, I guess you'd call it mentorship or something of that nature. And that actually that had been sort of what I had done at the uh, University of Illinois Graduate School of Library and Information Science, which has since name, changed its name to the iSchool. And, um, and that what one needed was to be able to match up, you know, people who had data issues or wanted, you know, kind of like the ESIP help desk to map people up with people who knew what needed to be done and, and who could shepherd that work um, through a volunteer community. And so our goals for participants here is that um, we're inviting you um, and hoping that many people in the ESIP community will become part of this network and it, by so doing, um, share some of the issues, risks, and opportunities involved with this kind of work. And um, and today, actually, we're going to try and actually rescue a data set. And we'll talk more about that a lot later. Um, and with that, um, you know, obviously, the issues and challenges that are part of the normal data conservation cycle um, are you know, going to probably become very, very obvious. And in many cases, you may come away with tools or resources to help you um, and with your data conservation processes and even possible risks and issues within your organization. And, but our goals as data at risk.org members is to sort of test our thoughts about these processes with a live experiment. So we don't know how it's going to go, but that's the whole point. <laughs> um, and to invite that engagement from all of you in the at risk data commons to help us shape this to best support community needs. And also to get feedback from you on, you know, our ideas and uh, proposed processes and, and that sort of thing um, to make sure we're headed in the right direction in it, towards something that actually is going to work for the larger community. And then um, I'm proud to say or happy to say that we might actually get data into a repository today. Um, so we do have participant roles. We have registered users who actually submit a data request. We call them submitters. We have facilitators who process those submissions, links them to data heroes 
links them with data heroes and confirms that the tasks are being done correctly and um, they they're kind of there as advisors during the process and those folks are called advocates and then last but certainly not least we have registered users who sign on to help do these data rescue tasks and they're called heroes and they may get tasks provisionally assigned to them based on their skills or they have the option to choose you know from a list of available tasks um, you know things that they want to do they obviously can't be anonymous the other two can uh, the reason for the anonymity of submitters is that it's conceivable that, uh, you know, people would not want to be um, noted um, as a submitter if, if there's some um, sensitivity, for example, political sensitivity around um, the submission. So with this, this is a high level process that we envision, very high level. I will say there are none of the loops and failure routes or any of that kind of thing is on this diagram. And probably many of you have seen that already. Um, but this is the high level process, you know, that a submitter submits a request. The advocate looks at that request, decides whether it's sane or not. I mean, if you ask, the data at risk commons to rescue two petted bytes of data in the next 24 hours. It's just plain old not going to happen. Um, and then they figure out what kind of tasks are needed. Um, you know, is this a digitization thing? Does the data format need to be changed? Is there any metadata? All of those sorts of things could, you know, come out of a request and you might end up with a, you know, fairly lengthy list of things to do, each of which requires some specific set of skills. Um, and then based on their own um, skill set, data heroes can then search through those lists of available tasks, select ones that meet their criteria and work on them. When they're done or if they run into trouble, um, the advocate can basically step back in and if they're done, check, check that the results are actually what was expected. And if not, um, try and figure out what needs to happen next, which may be, you know, creating uh, some more subsidiary tasks needing different skills, or maybe you have to assign this to somebody else if, if there's a due date looming and this person can't devote enough time to it now they realize that so there's there's a multiple uh multiplicity of ways that a an advocate um can check and see what you know has happened with the hero's work and if it all looks good then they can send that off and eventually the submitter when all the tasks are done, the submitter can say, oh yeah, that was great. And, and in that case, um, everything's cool. The data is there, it's been archived somewhere and it'll inform the future. Now, what of this have we actually implemented? Well, we have prototypes of some of it, probably the two big user facing parts of it, which are the requests submitted and um, the ability for looking through the list of things that can be worked on. And you'd say, well, that isn't a lot of progress, maybe, because that's more or less what I said in January, but that wouldn't be true. But I'll talk more about that uh, later, because I believe at this point, um, Katie is up. Um, okay. Hello. Um, hang on, give me one second. 
I don't think I am doing current status and plans, Ruth. I think that's still you. And then I'm introducing the exercise. Um, or that's what it says in our. Um, oh, we're supposed to do schedule. the meet and greet here, but there's. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's still do the, we let's can do the go, meet and greet I, still. I'm Chuck. Uh. <laughs> let's let's go ahead and do the meet and greet because we do have it. We do have a few people, and um, I think it might not be a bad, uh, you know, to kind of introduce us as uh, um, each of us as well. So um, I'll go ahead and start since I'm supposed to be the one who's who's running this one, at this part of it. Uh, my name is Denise Hills. I work at the Geological Survey of Alabama. Um, I do uh, research around hydrocarbon energy research, but um, one of the reasons that I am involved in this project is a lot of the data I use is legacy data, and it often needs an awful lot of help. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, there's often little funding for it. And so this is uh, data conservation um, is near and dear to my heart. Um, let's, uh, let's go to Katie next. Um, great. Um, yes, yeah, so I am Katie Micah. I'm a librarian. I work at Harvard Library. And I also have a position um, where I'm sort of embedded with the Institute of Quantitative Social Science, um, which is the product owner for a software called Dataverse. Um, and we have Harvard Dataverse is one of, Dataverse is an open source um, software project for um, data repositories. And Harvard Dataverse is um, an installation of that software, and it is a data repository that is free and open to the whole world. Um, anyone can upload any data type to it. It takes any file formats. Um, so I work on the curation team, and sort of as that part of my job, I obviously have a, um, I do a lot of work supporting folks who are um, doing data conservation work in other realms. Um, we try to, you know, work with the research community with different domains to sort of make sure that we have metadata standards um, added to Harvard Dataverse. We add custom metadata standards when necessary. Um, you know, we try and be as supportive as we can to whatever domain um, data are coming from. So as far as this project goes, um, the last thing I wanted to say is that the plan, if we so choose, to continue with our exercise um, will be to curate a data set um, and ultimately deposit it on Harvard Dataverse. So there will be sort of a bit of hands-on curation activity, um, working with the kind of a, a messy-ish data set that has some limited documentation we have to navigate around. Um, it's really a kind of a fun one to work on. Um, and then if you, if everybody would like to, um, we can stick around and sort of um, get a little tour of how Dataverse works um, and deposit a data set on um, Harvard Dataverse. So with that, I will pass it along to, I guess, Ruth, do you want to, you kind of introduced yourself, but if there's anything else you want to say? Um, other than the fact that um, I'm the person who sort of kicked this off and didn't expect that this was going to get kicked off. Um, it's true that I've been in the data world for an extremely long time, and this is something that's close uh, and dear to my heart, and I have been noted for telling researchers that if their data isn't available, then they're, then they're not actually a scientist. Mm -hmm. So. Let's go to. I like um, that. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to uh, Alexis. Unlike Ruth, I have not been in the data world for a very long time. Um, I'm relatively new. I'm a graduate student uh, at George Mason University at the moment, um, but I'm also a data librarian research associate for the Mohawk Preserve, which has had an ongoing data rescue digitization process for their archives that I've been really involved with, which has been really great. Um, and I do a lot of work working with um, citizen science data best practices and um, museum archive data best practices, which uh, data rescue is very relevant for. Excellent. Uh, Rama? Yeah, <clears throat> I guess I have met uh, quite a few of you, but uh, I, I do see a couple of people whom I have not met, so I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, I am uh, Rama Priyan. I go by Rama, and uh, I work for uh, 
company called SSAI, Science Systems and Applications Incorporated, as a contractor working from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center while living in California, so I'm really working remotely. And I worked for NASA Goddard for 38 years, uh, living in Maryland, and uh, have been working with the NASA's Earth Science Data Information System project that manages all the DACs that are around the country uh, for since it got started in 1990-ish. And uh, my primary focus these days is on data preservation and stewardship. And I'm an interested observer. Uh, I don't have any data sets that are at risk that uh, NASA has that I have to offer or anything like that, but I'm interested in watching what's happening in this group. That's fine. But Rama, you actually have some of the skills that we might want for uh, data heroes to help us actually save data sets that people submit. So we're looking at all aspects of this. Uh, Chuck, you're next. Sure. Uh, I'm uh, Chuck Vardaman. I'm a faculty member at the University of Notre Dame in the um, Department of Computer Science and Engineering and also a computational scientist in the Center for Research Computing. So my background is actually in theoretical chemistry. That's what my PhD is in. Um, I've been involved with open source science uh, for quite a while. Um, so my advisor founded uh, OpenScience.org back in 1998 which was a, a first attempt to use this new World Wide Web thing to start to uh, talk about why science should be open uh, and start cataloging open tools for scientists. Um, we developed a molecular dynamics package, so that's sort of my background is in material science and, and molecular dynamics and, and developing new theory for that, um, called OpenMD, which was one of the first uh, explicitly open source, open source license, BSD licensed uh, set of, of uh, computational tools for doing molecular dynamics. And as part of that, uh, one of the things we decided is that we wanted explicit metadata formats, right? And so previously, um, there were Fortran cards, essentially. So if you looked at some of the quote unquote open source, which weren't really open source, uh, they were binary open source. So you could download the binary and run it, but they weren't necessarily uh, open uh, source code. Um, but you have no idea what the data actually is. And it took forever for a scientist to try to figure out what the thing is actually doing. And we decided we didn't want that. Uh, and so we actually developed a sort of a schema. It looks a lot like JSON, a, com a combination of JSON and, and uh, sort of XML for um, documenting what an input file and what an output file and explicitly what a chemical system is and all these sorts of tags and everything else. Um, published, I think, a paper in 2002 or 2003, uh, which was one of the first, first sort of informatics sorts of, of things there. I joined the Center for Research Computing in uh, 2009 and became interested in applying explicit semantics to um, connect computational models to data. Uh, and so that's been the focus of my research in computer science for the past seven or eight years, I guess, um, is how can we leverage linked data, structured data, um, all of these explicit semantics ontologies, uh, ontology design patterns to basically, you know, connect uh, more explicitly data to models. And so um, I'm in the ESEP, um, you know, SMAG Tech Committee and the, harm and the harmonization cluster that Ruth and I are part of and science mm -hmm. on schema.org clusters. I'm pretty active in those. So. Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically my background. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Dan Fuca. You're muted. Dan? We'll come back to Dan. Amos. Hi there, I'm Amos Hayes. I'm with the Geomatics and Cartographic Research Center at Carleton University. Uh, we've been working um, on multidisciplinary uh, science uh, with, you know, sort of a heavier focus on the social sciences for some time now, uh, probably a decade and a half. Uh, and I've uh, been building an, um, for that entire length of time, <laughs> working on an open source uh, framework for uh, building um, building atlases, but really having them being built on top of uh, dynamic data sets, uh, distributed 
and uh, um, uh, distributed management type data sets. Um, and so uh, that, that is an open source framework and, and uh, more and more the groups we've been working with that, uh, that are, you know, working within their own domains are, are looking towards um, um, participating in the broader uh, data community and uh, maybe being um, more connected with other types of science. Um, and this has come about a, a, in a large way because of our work uh, sort of combining work of uh, classically trained uh, you know, Western scientists and say indigenous communities where uh, local knowledge and local expert uh, experts are um, uh, starting to uh, really work together uh, and being able to bridge some of those gaps in the systems is important too. So, um, so it's, uh, it's had a fair bit of traction there, but I'm, I was interested in, uh, in the data at risk. I, and I know uh, Ruth from, <laughs> from, from other things have started to get involved in the, the science and schema.org and, and, um, uh, and we've been working, uh, we just actually implemented schema.org uh, stuff within Moodle to allow for, for that kind of uh, publication of metadata. Um, and, uh, well, I've been interested in this and I, and I have been involved in some rescue uh, type of activities, both with the indigenous knowledge that we've been working with up north and other communities in the south, including Mohawk now. So I'm kind of curious to, to touch base with Alexis. Um, <laughs> and, um, and also, I guess most recently, spending a couple of weeks on St. Lawrence Island in, in Alaska, uh, digitizing collections of songs and dances and all kinds of stuff for, uh, uh, in, a, in a project related to, to that work. And so, acquiring old equipment and <laughs> figuring out all the possible different ways of encoding data on eight millimeter video cassettes, which is a surprise. And, and, uh, and that kind of, that kind of work to really try and uh, get things narrowed down and also to create processes that make it easier for people who are non-technical to do all the metadata um, work that has to go into that. So it's one thing to do. Oh, excellent, data, excellent. Data. Chop it up and it it sounds like you you might actually have like a use case oh yeah that we that we could uh that we could learn a lot from yeah. um so excellent i'm really glad you're here um dan fuca you there now all right so sarah you're up um what are we telling? I mean, I can kind of- uh, Who you are, uh, a little bit about your background. Um, who's here? Why are you interested in, in this session? Okay, uh, so my name is Sarah Ramdeen. Um, I know about half of you, so I'm kind of surprised to see new faces. This is great. Um, my background is a mixture of things. I started off as a geologist, and then I went on to get my uh, PhD in library and information science. So I come at this from a look of curation in that aspect for earth sciences. Um, I worked as a repository manager at the Florida Geological Survey for a number of years, managing their core and cuttings collections, and then was really inspired by that work to go and get my PhD because I wanted to learn more about developing these best practices, doing all this stuff that involves not just data rescue, but all the preservation, the management, the stewardship, the access, supporting the science getting done. Um, and so for my PhD, I studied what's called in library science um, information seeking behavior. It's how scientists look for answers to the questions that they have. So I was very curious about how looking for data is different than looking for a journal article. Looking for samples to create data is also different from looking at those things. So there were lots of questions about, well, how do people find these things? Uh, in order to support better discovery, but also because some of that feeds back into the preservation aspect of it. And sometimes even the, um, the rescue aspect of things like we have these samples, what information about them do you need to capture in order for someone to be able to reuse them in the future so that they do have that value. Um, so I've been interested in that topic and this area for a while now. And now I work at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia. I'm a postdoc there working on CESAR, the system for earth science, or sorry, earth sample registration. And um, we provide a registry where you can register your samples and get a unique identifier, the IGSN, which is one part of the larger ecosystem then in managing and tracking samples throughout their life cycle. Um, so it's very interested to me in my own personal research, as well as this stuff all relates to what I do for a living because I've often assisting 
uh, repository managers or everyday scientists with how do I capture information about my samples, register them in CSAR in order to allow someone to access them in the future. Excellent. Yay. I'm glad, Sarah, I'm glad you're here. Um, your experience really uh, helps us with all of this. Um, Dan is back. He had to, he had had to step aside for a moment. Um, introduction, who you are, why you're interested uh, in this session. Ah, hi, yeah, I'm Daniel Fugo. I'm at Virginia Tech University. Um, and uh, I'm working on a couple of projects that uh, yeah, are uh, centered across uh, many different scientific domains, specifically get, uh, 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 collecting new data from very, very inexpensive sensors uh, with uh, varying levels of expertise, assumed no expertise uh, uh, in uh, the data sciences uh, when they do it. So uh, uh, very inexpensive, three to five dollar sensors that uh, you, what you might be actually looking at is uh, high schoolers or junior or high schoolers might be actually programming and implementing them. And during that time, they are sending data somewhere and we want to find out where that somewhere is, though while that is happening, we also have to figure out how to get uh, 10 years of uh, ontology semantics experience into making sure that we know what that student's um, uh, uh, data actually is, just in case it's useful in the fu for future scientific discoveries. Is that enough? That, that's perfect. That is perfect. And I think um, that leads us into, Ruth, did you have anything else on the kind of current status and plans um, with data at risk? Or did we cover all of that in your no, actually, I have several slides to go, um, so I'll okay. share my screen so, again. So, yes, it's those, and then, then Katie will talk about what um, our plans are for after that. Okay, so this is uh, back to status and plans for the dataatrisk.org. Oh. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Huh. That was a weird noise. OK, so as I talked about before, um, really, there are two components to this. One is we're putting together an organization, uh, a nonprofit organization. And the other is um, there are you know, tooling that is needed in order to play this match.com type role. And so the idea of that tooling is that anybody, data owners, managers, or other people can nominate assets assets for targeted preservation action and that those um, nominations will be looked at by uh, basically we're calling them um, data advocates but they're basically people who know something about data management and and have t tasks created so that community volunteers can actually uh, sign up to do um, one or more of those tasks. And the whole point here is to get, um, the public is heavily now involved in um, take making scientific data or creating it through citizen science projects. Well, this is to extend that to basically ensuring the longevity of the data that is created via whatever route. And so um, it basically, um, our tool basically facilitates those activities. And so ever since the very first meeting, um, we've been supported by a company called Cloudburst that um, Joan Saez um, uh, is a member of, I guess. Um, and they've actually been hosting the website for us ever since then. Um, and I think sh this is basically, you know, something that Joan is very invested in because um, I guess she's just one of us data manager -y types. She really strongly believes that data needs to be available. And it is true that in her company, they're often dealing with data and often dealing with government data. And if that went away or its uh, availability changed, that would hurt their company. 
So um, last year, we developed a relationship with the Science Gateways community. Um, and that's an NSF funded an initiative that supports what they call incubator projects, where they try and get nascent organization to, and tools to um, become self-sustaining, et cetera. And we attended their boot camp last year. And because of that, we actually um, have been granted a quarter time technical development support um, from Andrew McGill at uh, University of Texas. And in addition to the te technical development support, we also have some security and user um, interface type work upcoming. And then we've also started working with their business uh, section, I guess you call it, on the topics of sustainability, onboarding processes for new people, and um, volunteer management. So that's just now starting up. And I have a little bit more about all of these um, in that these are sort of contractual activities with SGCI. And so the work that's, that um, is being done by Andrew is basically on fleshing out our high level specifications, um, which are basically complete at this point. And, and I actually copied in a, a section of that. And you, you see that each section links out to much more complete sections if those currently exist. And that should be um, completing, well, actually, the, we would be doing reviews of these materials <laughs> these weeks, except for we have the CSIP meeting instead. <laughs> so, so we're making progress on that. And he's also working on the low level specs. What, what Joan needs for her a company is detailed specifications such that she can hand them to people like a database administrator and a, you know coder and a you know user interface person to actually just go implement without you know having to do a lot of in-house um, thinking of, about it. And so she's been she kind of has been uh, driving the format of how these come out. And so here's an example of what a, a low level spec would um, be. And you notice that it's talking about what are the individual component tasks and requirements. Um, and the, he's also working on the data model. model um, and as well, um, specifications of text on forms. And this one I just thought was kind of uh, interesting. I put it up here just because it's kind of an amusing way of, I mean, do you need superpowers to be a data hero? No. <laughs> Anyways, I thought it was interesting to look at, but, um, but it basically instructions to give uh, people um, who are going to be implementing this stuff, the exact uh, everything they need to know, what to put on the web page, et cetera. And so, these are the kinds of um, uh, tasks that we expect data heroes to probably have to do. Things like format migration, metadata creation, updating metadata, finding new homes or foster home for the data, manipulating it to do various things, digitization, relocation, access, etc. We've been doing this through the lens of use cases. Um, Amos, <laughs> call you out directly there. Um, and here are the use cases we currently have been working on. We actually, the first one here is made up, but, it, um, but it's actually a, a scenario that Denise and I both have real experience with. I mean, yeah, mine wasn't 1930s streams and waterways imagery. Instead, it was glacier imagery. Um, um, but and she has similar experiences. So it's it's something that's we know very common. And um, but the rest of them are with real data. 
Um, we actually have, I uh, ha have, there's several hundred instruments from NASA's Space Science Directorate at the NSSDC or whatever they call themselves now. I, I, they changed their name recently, I thought. In any case, um, they, they're very, they have all the bits and they have perhaps a PDF of the original mimeographed um, information about those bits, but they're very old bits. <laughs> they predate ASCII, they predate EPSIDIC, they predate BCD. And it, that data has never been migrated format forward. So it's, so basically it's at this point, not that usable. And uh, so, so what we were requested to do is to basically take that data and uh, turn it into CDF, which is the format that community uses with space metadata. Um, then we have structureless IOT data, which is an EarthCube associated data set that I think Dan is very familiar with. Um, and then um, physical core samples. Um, so those are the ones we're working with so far. And that's the one we're actually going to try and do today. So um, I also said that they're helping us with our business planning. And, and here's the milestones for that is that we're working on sustainability models and the onboarding process and a volunteer management plan. And we hope to have that all um, well understood and documented, et cetera, um, here in a couple of months. And I believe that was my last slide. So if there's any questions, I'd take them now. Ruth, I have a question for you. Sure. The, the projects that I've been involved with so far that have had lots of data, typically um, they've had someone or some organization that, that is interested in saving it. <laughs> they have um, had, uh, you know, there's been, they've had data that requires a fair chunk of work, possibly travel, all kinds of things involved to make it happen. Um, and I, I know you've been talking about volunteers uh, and you've been talking about, you know, sort of funding the organization, but how, how would you see, uh, I mean, imagining that there's going to be um, people coming, you know, who need something done and are hoping that you can help put them in touch with the right people or, or help get it done uh, through the organization umbrella, but they need it done and they need it done you know, it's not necessarily a, a, something that's going to fly on a volunteer basis. And how do you see that um, getting handled? And is that a case that you're expecting to handle? Well, if if we get a request that we can't handle, we'll, we'll you know, obviously tell them that we can't handle it and why. Um, in a lot of the cases that I think you might be thinking of, though I'm probably putting thoughts into your mind. <laughs> well, you're, probably, um, you're probably in the right, going in the right direction. <laughs> um, um, you know, the if, okay, so for, we have a cadre of volunteers already to do some of this kind of work, but they're, but they're the standard volunteers you can think of, you know, retired NOAA people, for example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or, or uh, computationally uh, expert type people who think that this would be fun, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's all well and good, um, but that's this whole bit about skills, um, because some of those people might be appropriate for some of your tasks, and others certainly wouldn't be appropriate for other ones. And, and this is all volunteer. So the question is, how can we encourage people, you know, through badges and, you know, all the normal kinds of socialization mechanisms 
to, to contribute. And if you have some special knowledge or skills um, related to, say, for example, uh, communities needs to uh, ensure the um, privacy of parts of the data that they're, you know, trying to have, you know, personally, I'd make them a data hero and responsible for that part. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I, you know, I'm picturing projects like, like the ones I've been dealing with, like even that last one in Alaska, right? It was a ton of travel. Uh, it's been 59 days of solid work so far. Uh, you know, and if you're asking somebody who's got the experience to do that, to volunteer, one would hope they're already time, in Alaska <laughs> or willing yeah. to travel. So, so some of these are trickier. So may, maybe it's you know maybe it's fine when it's a you know um, you know smaller collections or it's easy to parcel out. Um, some of it that requires maybe purchase of equipment or that kind of, I mean, there's probably about seven grand worth of equipment that was bought to be able to do this, you know, real to real tape decks and all kinds of stuff that you're like shopping on eBay for antique things and whatever. I get that kind of point, especially for multimedia, you know, you, you start to run into the time, I mean, time issues because it's not just as fast as you can do it, right? It has, there's, there's time built into the formats. Um, so, you know, I'm just wondering how, how it, cause I saw, you know, funding and sustainability in there and wonder rather than saying we can't do this you're on your own is it going to turn into we can't do this but here's maybe people who can and if that's going to happen are you going to sort of formalize that process in some way so that nobody feels like yes you know that's being handed off to your buddy or you know <laughs> you know how would the organization handle that and is there an opportunity to fund some of the sustainability of the volunteer efforts through um through uh, referrals of paid opportunities or something i don't know Just thinking um we haven't been looking at funding the data heroes so much as trying to make sure the data advocates who at least know what needs to be done mm -hmm. get funded um but i note that uh we're open to all of that and yes we wouldn't you know if we knew something that would help somebody you know like you should go to the blah 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 foundation um we would certainly do that <laughs> um yeah. so it wouldn't be a leave people cold if we can at all manage it yeah. um and my big concern is getting totally overwhelmed by requests that yeah. has always been my big concern mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, you go and say we're going to do your digitizing for free uh <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that, that is something that we're looking at within the sustainability model, whether or not, um, you know, there, there is potential for some hybrid uh, cost recovery methods where, you know, kind of Joe Public, you know, maybe we do it for free, but if it's a company or an organization that might be able to contribute to the cost, that, that we're able to do at least cost recovery. Or if, or if time frames or certain levels of work are required. Right, exactly. And so, so that's one of the things that, that we're looking at right now, um, how to how to balance, you know, kind of the functional needs to continue with all of this with, um, you know, kind of the, the lofty ideal of, yeah, we, the main thing we want to do is save all this data. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it's like your experience doing, doing the work in Alaska and all of that, um, I think really does feed into a lot of what the thoughts that we're we've been having and you know yeah. some of the challenges and all of that yeah. so. some of it lends itself well to being parceled up right if you think right about. right and and um that is one of the roles that we see for an advocate is being able to help determine what can be parceled out and what might need to be uh done uh not so much by a community or a volunteer effort but by a paid professional um, and so that's probably going to be some of, of what the, the advocate's role is, is to help do that parceling out. I think that that person may be asked, even if it's not the hat they're wearing within this organization, that we, at least the groups that we're working with, they're just, who can do this? Like, tell yeah. us, tell us who and how much. Yes. So if yeah. an advocate can, can say, well, some of this could be done through these types of means and other things are like, well, you're talking about this and that, and it typically mm -hmm. looks like yeah. this, and this kind of budget you should be thinking of, yes. right? That can be something that can even start the ball rolling for someone to go out and find yeah. and do 
something. Yeah, and that, yeah, I that think whole... that's a hugely important piece of it because when you get into um, volunteer networks like this, it always you run the risk of devaluing labor that is usually very expensive, very um, hard to come by, very difficult to secure funding for in the first place. And so then we, what we don't want to become is sort of a group that is offering some of these services for free, so to speak, and and then, you know, reducing the, I mean, there's already a major problem with, um, you know, funding project archivists and um, project curators that are, you know, not paid a living wage and, you know, are doing a lot of really highly professional work, but are not being compensated for it, yeah, you know, to the work. level that would be appropriate. And so then I think you're right, what you said earlier about using this platform as sort of a method for leveraging kind of, you know, the expertise that we do have to sort of developing some kind of project plan to advocate for, you know, this amount of grant funding to actually do this very difficult kind of, you know, long-term project stuff. And I could see those, those you know, it's, when I'm thinking those costs need to be visible even if someone is funding it, it needs to be on the books so you can go in. And so it's not just quietly being subsidized elsewhere. And like, as you say, it gets devalued. Instead, you say, well, putting a value on this, right? Thank you for doing this. And in the case of volunteers, that's, that's great. <laughs> There's people who are willing to volunteer their time. But in the case of sort of um, maybe when someone comes and they, and they don't have funding and uh, I hate to throw another big application at people, but you know, maybe what Data at Risk does for those projects that do need funding is to help source the funding or to have, you know, their own, a grant program of our own, right, or something, <laughs> you know. I, that might be a, a good, you know, longer term effort, but term, yeah, yeah, you know, it's like we're, we're, we're trying to do the little bit that we can at the start and then hopefully start to start to grow it out. But those are issues that are definitely on, at least I know they've been on my radar. I'm sure they've been on, okay. on, on Katie and Ruth. Yes, well. definitely. <laughs> so if you, if you yeah. do get volunteers, uh, it may be useful to document the equivalent value of their services. Yes, actually, um, believe it or not, Joan did that because she actually did the Boulder Data Rescue thing, and she is a business person, so she got that right away. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so yes, I, that is understood. Just, just, but it's on the radar. <laughs> yes. Yep. Okay. All right. So, I what we have on our schedule for the the final 30 35 minutes um we can continue having some informal discussion but uh we wanted to kind of uh do the setup of what, what kind of the work that we want to do in um the the second half of this workshop um and katie was going to set that up for us um, and what I want you all to be thinking about, if it is just this few people, Ruth and Katie, do we want to actually just do it all as one group or do we still want to split out heroes and advocates? Uh, that, that's a good question. Probably. Okay. We'll talk about that. Group. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we can talk about that. <laughs> right. You're yeah. anticipating. Okay. So Katie. Yeah. I mean, since we have, um, you know, a great group of people that are, very um, engaged in what we've been talking about so far. Um, I, I'm going to introduce what the plan was, and then maybe you guys can let us know what makes the most sense to you, what how you'd prefer to kind of walk through it. Um, since we are, I think, a little bit ahead of schedule also, um, which rarely happens, but hooray. <laughs> um, I don't have any slides, so I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen quickly. Um, but before I do, so what we thought about working through is um, considering the a test drive of um, our workflows, basically, of the working model that we have for um, the way a project might trickle through the dataatrisk.org um, platform. And so essentially, as Ruth described, you know, you have the first step in which um, a data set is uh, nominated, so to speak, is submitted to the platform. Um, the next step that happens is a 
um, user, which we call advocates, um, you know, receive the submission, evaluate it to some degree, develop a project plan, um, and then create tasks based on that project plan. Um, and then heroes fit into the mix. These data heroes um, are the ones that are executing a number of these tasks, uh, marking them as complete, um, you know, putting any output in a um, accessible location for either the next hero to take up and work on if it has to be sequential, um, or, you know, finishing it by depositing it in a, in a repository. Um, we are domain agnostic, platform agnostic, um, tool agnostic. So all of these tasks, so to speak, can be done, you know, really however the hero wants. Um, and there's a process by which um, a hero will then, you know, mark the task complete, submit the materials, the advocate can go in and review to make sure that the task was completed successfully. Um, and then the next task can be checked out. We're, we're a little iffy on, it, it will unlikely be such structured such that um, all tasks need to be completed sequentially, um, just by nature of data curation. Some things are iterative, some things um, can be done at the same time. So it doesn't necessarily need to be one and then the other in a linear sequence, but that's the general idea that we have. Um, and so originally the, the concept was to kind of break into two main groups, um, an advocate's path and a hero's path. Um, the advocates would generally be working through um, the submission details. So we have a data set that was submis submitted. It has you know, some documentation with it. It's the raw data. Um, working through developing what would a project plan look like for this submission. Um, and then the outcome of that would be a development of the tasks um, related to this submission that would need to be completed by the heroes. Um, and so then the, the other track would be the heroes track. And so we've, have, we've done a little bit of pre-processing, I suppose, or planning for this such that um, there is a project plan that has been, you know, written by an advocate already in, in our imaginations, but, you know, for real, for this for purposes of this um, workshop. And so anybody that selects sort of the hero path could, um, you know, spend a little bit of time working on, you know, there's two main elements, which is data cleaning and transforming, um, and then writing documentation or collecting kind of the documentation that's already available and putting it into, um, you know, a, a more understandable, um, you know, thing that can be uploaded to um, a repository. Um, and then at the very end, we could go ahead and um, Dataverse has a demo site, which is useful for testing and, you know, uploading lots of stuff and figuring out how you want to organize the Dataverse. Um, and so we can use that demo site um, to work through what a, what a de deposition would look like, what a deposit to um, a repository would look like. And then um, that would be kind of a work through the whole hands-on um, curation activity for a relatively kind of common low-hanging fruit type of data set, type of submission that we expect to get um, through the system. Um, so with that being said, um, how do you guys wanna proceed with this? Would it be interesting to still break it up into the two groups? Um, would it be more interesting to kind of work through both together? Um, I think based on the numbers, I think it'd be really interesting to hear from, um, you know, everybody <laughs> about both pieces. So um, I think I'd be in favor of keeping it together, but um, you know, the original method is also um, in play if that's what you guys want to do. Uh, the other thing to note is that actually our our audience is growing. So who knows how many we'll have eventually? <laughs> I, I would like, to, I would like to suggest we uh, do the first one together, and that we pose this as a ESIP uh, no, 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 one in which uh, maybe more people want to go through the steps. An ESIP after hours beverages uh, no, 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 get together. 
<laughs> yeah, that'll be a little hard with all this long distance stuff. <laughs> oh no, no, I was. I, 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 so we're do, we're looking at a virtual one, and I've already got a theme: uh, uh, ease up after hours, beverages, water, wine, beer, or blood required to attend. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, it's important to cater to the vampire contingent. I mean, that's the. <laughs> Apparently. Apparently. Uh, well, well, welcome to, to the uh, three people who just joined, uh, Robert and Shannon, and um, I'm going to guess Fred, but you, uh, I can't necessarily guess just from the uh, Fred Aloza is the, uh, it could be a last name, I'm not sure. Right. Right. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with the name off the top of my head, um, but just to do a brief catch up. Um, we did a background on um, the at-risk data commons at dataatrisk.org, and we were just uh, um, this first part of the session was was primarily kind of the setup, the description of the problem that we're going to look at in the second half of the workshop, and including the types of roles that we're going to kind of test run. Um, was that a good thirty-second summary? It's a 30 second summary, that's for sure. I do think <laughs> though, that we should, we should invite our newbies to, um, to tell us a little bit about their self and why they're interested with this, because that was very illuminating with the um, uh, people who've been here since the beginning. So yeah. I at least wanted to give them a little bit of a setup before I asked them to talk about themselves. So right. uh, Robert, let's start with you since you're first on my list of newbies. Hi, sure. Um, well, actually, um, I, I got into the sessions a little tardy, so I was trying to explore what each one was, and I wasn't quite clear on on this one. So I was just hoping to get, you know, better informed. Um, but uh, I'm I'm a little at a loss, so I, I I'm not quite quite sure what direction to go in, uh, or I guess I need more understanding. So, um, just to catch you up a little bit further. <laughs> There's an organization called the data at .org that is a very nascent organization just setting up, setting up or getting going. Its goal is to preserve data that um, or to and to act as a match.com between people who have data needs and people who have skills that could help with those data needs. It's kind of a match.com for data, basically. Um, and the way it works is that there are three kinds of people. People who have submit issues, they have data, they have maybe no place to put it, or it's old data and it's not in a modern format, or whatever the issue may be, they're called submitters and they submit their request. And then there are people who are data experts, uh, data management type experts, people who know what to do with data to make it useful for other people who look at that and go, well, for this data, you need to do these 12 things. <laughs> and so they create a list of tasks for people. And those tasks probably have different skill sets involved. You know, the skill sets for metadata creation are different than the programming skill sets needed to reformat data, for example. And so then they would, um, create that list and then so those are the data advocates and then there are data heroes who would who are for the most part volunteers who would um you know say mm, i'm good at metadata i kind of think that's fun okay yeah there are people like that believe it or not um and they select tasks that meet their interests and skill sets and then they go off and do them and then the advocate looks at them and says up oh, yep okay that worked or uh that's not quite what we needed and works with the heroes to complete or fail them <laughs> in some cases it's conceivable that a task can't be completed because the last machine in the world that could read that kind of thing is dead um mm -hmm. And, but if everything is fine, then they go back to the submitter and ask the submitter, okay, so we think we accomplished everything you needed and, and here's the results, do you agree? So that, that's basically what this idea is. It's a match.com between uh, 
public people who want to help in the scientific and cultural heritage and et cetera type process uh, by, by volunteering to help preserve the data. Thanks, Ruth. I appreciate the, uh, the update. Um, Robert, one of the things we were doing is, is uh, giving a little bit more information about our background, uh, like where we are and what we do. Um, and if you said that, I think I missed it. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, OK, um, so my uh, focus area has been on um, a particular type of semantic uh, uh, technology, namely uh, knowledge models, uh, ontologies, that sort of thing. Uh, terminology and definition development and I guess uh, so that would include metadata and that sort of thing uh, I'm in I'm in New York at the moment uh, and I have uh, um, I'm trying to contribute to some ESIP uh, uh, groups um, and um, uh, I think I, I joined in 2019 and I'm also part of some other groups outside that have um, either standards development or just other research groups related to uh, knowledge models, ontologies, and that sort of thing in a couple of different organizations. Um, and I'm also on the, on the hunt for a PhD studentship looking for uh, professors or opportunities to find that um, for a couple of project ideas. And uh, that's basically it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Shannon. Hi, I am Shannon Christofferson. I am the Manager of Data and Information Services at the Arctic Institute of North America at the University of Calgary. My background is in librarianship. I'm also a team member on the Canadian Consortium for Arctic Data Interoperability, and I see some of my team members are in this chat as well. And I am also on the a Semantics and Vocabularies Working Group with, uh, with Ruth. Um, I apologize. I did uh, intend to attend the whole session, but I had a conflict with another workshop. Uh, my interest in data rescue is, I'm really interested in data conservation and data rescue, and particularly as it pertains to um, pulling data out of bibliographic resources like articles and books. Uh, from the past, we have a few of our researchers working on that. And I run a bibliographic database, so I'm interested in seeing the ways we can pursue that. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. And trust me, we all understand conflicts. It's, it's hard to carve out the time, even when everything is virtual right now. Um, and uh, the final person that I'm not sure of their name, Fred, Fred Aloza. Fred Aloza. Oh, I scared them away. <laughs> I screwed up their name and they ran away. <laughs> these, uh, you know, these streamer names and stuff when you're in, in these video game systems and people have these ridiculous names and it's always really funny when you see companies sort of handing out a prize for somebody who's been on the stream or something. They have to say some ridiculous name that someone came up with and they're always <laughs> you know, trying to figure out how to pronounce it. What is this? Oh and, yeah, well, and some of them are just not pronounceable, yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, so we still have, we, in this part of the session, we still have about 20 minutes um, because, uh, so did we wanna talk a little bit more about what we were going to do um, in the second half? Uh, Katie, this is kind of your show. Yeah, part, I think. Um, sure. So we can um, kind of give a bit of an overview of um, the tools. Well, not the tools we've been using, but um, the way we've been kind of working through these um, scenarios. So I'm going to throw a. Um, both a link into the chat and then I'm gonna start sharing my screen. So this um, should be open. Um, this essentially is the data that we're going to be uh, working with. Um, it is been generously submitted by Daniel Fuca. So thank you for that. Um, 
Well, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions for you as we work through this. Um, and give me one second. Gonna and all this group has to do relatively quickly is find an article in this and get it published. <laughs> I don't think this group should have any problem with that. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's the data. Um, and then one more sort of link that um, I'm going to, um, now that I've shared, now I don't know where my chat is. There we go. Um, I'm not sure if this one is open, so let me know if it isn't. Um, so this is kind of the template that we've been using for working through our use cases and working through kind of thinking through all of the pieces of a data set of a data curation process that um, will need to be accomplished. Um, essentially, what we start with is um, we give it a title, which is helpful. Trust me, it seems silly, but it's helpful. Um, a description of um, what you can glean from the data, of what you can glean from the project, of any kind of background information of how this data kind of came to our hands um, is, is interesting and useful to keep in mind. Um, primary actor and supporting actors. So anybody, any individual that's involved in the creation of these data, um, stakeholders and interests is worth taking the time to um, think really critically about who would be interested in um, either an end user, a reuser of these data, um, someone who might be creating, in this case, um, similar types of data um, and what they might learn from this process or what they might learn from these data if they come into um, contact with them, if they discover them, things like that. Um, what types of researchers might be interested in using the data, what types of um, you know, other community members, whether it's uh, policymakers, um, you know, members of the public who are interested in you know, learning more about a specific topic, anything like that. Um, preconditions is just what we call kind of what does the data look like at the beginning? What are we starting with? Um, post conditions, kind of what are, what are the outcomes that we anticipate um, having? So we start with the success end condition. So that is what would be a win? Like what do we really, what would be the, the 10 out of 10 um, product that we end up with after doing a full curation of um, the data. The way that I, I keep using this word data curation, and if you're not familiar with it, I just sort of use it as an all-encompassing term to mean any of the stuff that you do to a data set or to a collection of data or of stuff to um, turn it into a set of files and documentation and metadata um, that you know can be more discoverable or, or apply some intellectual control over the um, data set as a whole. Um, so the success end condition would be, you know, what are this, what would that product look like? Um, a failure end condition is, um, you know, what's a failure? What do we, what would be just giving up? What would be kind of, you know, usually it's kind of nothing happens, but um, there might be some additional information that you would not want to add to that one, depending on the scenario. Um, a minimal acceptable outcome is really helpful to keep in mind. Um, what is something that would make the data um, reusable in a very basic level? Um, so I don't want to kind of go into um, what the um, what we're really calling kind of high quality, low quality data curation standards, um, but I, I do want to sort of it's useful, I think, to consider what are the, um, what would be a, a minimum standard, what would be sort of the lowest possible outcome that would still be um, somewhat positive, that would still be useful. Um, if you're turning data from something that is, you know, really challenging and difficult to use to something that's even just a little bit better, that would in many cases be considered a minimal acceptable outcome. Um, here is where the meat usually goes. Um, this is the main success scenario. So this is really where um, we've been adding, what are the actual tasks that individuals um, are doing? So, um, you know, 
hours when we're working through use cases for this project um, tend to look a little bit more robust than I think we'll en end up with anything today. Um, so really what we're looking for here is um, what is what is a task that's going to be associated with um, curating these data um, and coming up with a list of those um, would kind of be a project plan, the end of a project plan for um, a data advocate position. Um, we can think of extensions and variations if you want to, but I, I think that's probably too out of scope for today. Um, special requirements might be useful to keep in mind um, if there's anything that you think might be essential. Security requirements can also can can often be important to think about. Um, especially if there's any sensitive inf sensitive information um, which pops up more than you would imagine maybe um, things like that. So um, yeah, and then let's just ignore issues and um, to do for the purposes purposes of our um, work today. So it might make more sense after we go through the data a little bit. Um, I don't wanna look at it too much because I think that that's gonna be kind of the main work that we're gonna be doing as data advocates. Um, but I do want to show that this um, file right here is going to be um, our raw data that we're working with. Um, and then this document right here is going to be um, what we have as far as documentation. And I know we do have um, Dan here with us, but I think we would like to see how much we can do with things that already have been created um and and i know. would like to note also that um through the advocates track i really would like to talk about the conversations that happened and what you might think was needed in order to even arrive at that document because i think those will be something that usually have to happen so um so please get rid of that document already <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So um, we have about 10 more minutes before we have a 30 minute break. Um, and so there might be a couple things that we could do in that time. We could talk a little bit more specifically about the data set that we're going to be looking at. Um, we could go through uh, you know, one of our other user scenarios that is a um, the one I was thinking of, uh, just so you can kind of see some of the steps that we we have already been thinking about. Um, the one I was thinking that we could walk through if there is interest is the one on the 1930s uh, streams and waterways. Um, if that might be something, because that starts to look at, you know, the kinds of things that an advocate does and the um, the types of skills that some heroes may need. Um, but it, particularly with, with such a, a small small group, I, we really want this to be as useful for you as it is for us, so. May I ask a question uh, of Katie? So when she was talking about that, uh, essentially what was looking like a form where you're filling out various, various things, uh, the question is, is that a standard form that you guys have been using in Dataverse when you receive data to be uh, archived? Uh, no, this is um, this has nothing to do with Dataverse. Um, actually, if you take a look at it closer, it um, barely relates to data. <laughs> um, okay. it, it is, is a, yeah, it's just a use case template that Ruth okay. and I uh, came across and tweaked a little bit to make it more useful for us. So it, it was just ways for us to, to start organizing and thinking about the different types of scenarios that okay. uh, we may come across and a way to kind of document all the bits and pieces that, mm -hmm. that are gonna go into um, this sort of process. Okay. That's why I suggest it might be useful for us to walk through one of the scenarios that we're not actually doing but uh, my, to just to give everybody a little bit of an idea of, of the sort of thought process that we go through. Um, I think it would be fine to walk through the 1930s 
waterways one um i i would like to sort of make it clear that it um i wouldn't say it broke us but it is it, one of the most complex um use scenarios that um, a large portion of which um, is not possible based on our initial um, project planning workflows. So there are tasks that are created that largely will not be able to be supported through our, you know, network through dataeverest.org yet. Yet, yes. This this is this would be um, this is more aspirational, I guess, is a good way to put it. Uh, this is one of the things that we would like to get to because we all, we do feel that this is going to be the kind of thing that we do get um, people submitting to us. All right, so let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, screen, desktop one. All right, do you see my overly complicated screen now? Yes. <laughs> and we're all traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> all right, is, is that a good size? Do I need to, to increase the size anymore? It looks fine to me. All right. Um, so essentially, I, uh, to address Rama's question from earlier, um, this was, th this was a template so we could kind of walk through a lot of um, the thought process on how, if someone were to submit a data set like this. Um, so, you know, we gave it a name and the brief description, um, this is what we would get from the data submitter. Uh, data consists of images that were taken in 1930s of streams and waterways. Um, and the, the challenge is that um, the, the, the Open building it. Open that, it that, up. that was uh, images uh, in the, um, are at the Knockle Old Crap Library, which this is why we know that it's made up. So Knockle. Um, Denise, do you mean to have the, um, the use case open? Because we just see your, um, your, your drive folder. Really? Oh, okay. Wrong one. Wrong window. Okay, let me let me see. Yeah. All right. Well, well, well it was better there for a second. It was almost there. There yeah, we go. No. Better. Okay, now we got it. Yes. Yeah. All right. It apparently wants to share my laptop screen. That thinks that's screen one. Sorry. As opposed to the big one. That hold on. I have all these notifications. That now won't go away. Hold on. All right. All right. So you can see it now, right? You see description now? Are we good? Yes. All right. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Tech is awesome sometimes. Uh, anyway, so. Um, the submitter knows that the building is going to be destroyed. And so these actual physical hard copy images need a new home. And as far as the submitter knows, there's no actual digital uh, record of these images, as well as the submitter is unclear as to whether or not there is any um, digital metadata. So, so the, the stakeholders, the kinds of people who are going to be potentially interested in this sort of data set. And this is one of the things that Katie was, was referring to earlier is kind of looking at the variety of people that you have. Um, you can imagine that historians, hydrologists, hunters, environmentalists, geographers, land use change would all be interested in this sort of thing. Um, and kind of the, the end conditions, uh, which really do kind of help you think about where some exit points may be, like if you run out of money or you can't so identify. The, so the stakeholders list is what the OAIS would call designated user community. Yeah, similar, similar. Um, exactly, yeah. Rama. Yes. So the success would be that the imagery is digitized with modern metadata and both are now housed in a repository with, with aspirations for long-term maintenance and access. Um, as well as a home for the physical images. 
uh, failure is that the images are lost without any sort of preservation, digital or otherwise. And then the, what, we de what we deemed in this case as a minimal acceptable outcome is a home for the physical images has been identified and has appropriate climatic conditions to preserve these for the near term. Um, so that helps us define kind of where we, like I said, where you might have some exit points or where you may, may need to um, pull in some of these outside people that we were talking about. So should the minimal acceptable outcome say something about metadata and uh, accessibility and locatability of the thing? Well, I, so the minimal acceptable outcome would be a, essentially that the that the physical images are at least at least have a new home uh, so that they might still be digitized and any sort of metadata that we that does currently exist will remain connected to those physical images. So because this, this is a case where it is a it is physical objects in a location that is going away um, you have a different maybe a different sort of minimal acceptable outcome than um, if you have some sort of digital I, you know, this is, this is sometimes, sometimes we envision um, this process almost as a stopgap as to make sure that things don't get worse. Right. Right. Um, like, like the case where the spouse of a recently deceased researcher calls and says, we've got to clean up this basement. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Essentially. Yes. yes. Had. <laughs> and it's like, right. okay. Somebody going to pay for a storage locker? Where is this going to go until we can figure it out? Right, right. It's like, come get this stuff out of the house or I'm just throwing it to the curb, almost. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and so it's like, we know that, that sometimes that that is going to be all we might be able to do. Um, it, and, is there a indication of value? So I, I can imagine certain data sets just because, you know, they have a very, very broad sort of applicability are highly valuable as versus, you know, the the data set of the researcher, you know, who has, you know, um, a bunch of files in his basement, which may or may not be as of much use, right? So if you're trying to figure out, you know, um, allocation of resources, right? Is there a way that you you sort of can evaluate that? Yeah, that is part of this um, uh, data advocate's role is okay. to try and start figuring that out. Okay. Um, because you're right. Um, some data will be of more value than others, though I will note that some people's opinion of that uh, may not always be valued. And I'll give you an example. Um, I talked about how I did sort of this project um, at NSIDC with their glacier photo collection, which was started to be accumulated in places like Alaska in the late 1800s during the first polar year and, and around that. And also um, had old records from old images from Europe and South America, et cetera. And so, you know, it's a, now I guess about a 130 year record of glaciers and glacier change. And the scientists at NSIDC didn't really think that was valuable and were kind of thinking that, you know, they would just like toss that stuff out. But we managed to get a, a little bit of funding through a variety of mechanisms to get some of that digitized and put online and in particular the original uh, people who had taken those pictures were scientists and who recognized that you could use such photos for mass wasting types of studies of glaciers if you knew exactly where they were taken from and so there's a series of um, you know geological spikes whatever they call those spikes. Yeah. Um, and, and they noted all of that information and including the log book of the persons um, doing this it included, you know, sketches of the area and all sorts of things. Um, so that personally, I think they have interest all over the place. Anyway, so we started to get those digitized and online and it quickly became the most popular a data set that NSIDC had in terms of numbers of downloads. So it went from, we don't think there's any value here yeah. to the public mm -hmm. loves it and it's in 
in um, Burns's documentaries. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, yeah. I, that, that makes complete sense to me. But I guess my only point was is that, you know, because uh, quote unquote value is subjective, but you still have a, a finite resource allocation that, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of advocates and, and you know, uh, processors, right? Heroes. Right. Um, that you, you still have to do that, that mapping. And so having right. some explicit, and I guess that that's probably part of what you're trying to figure out here, you know, having some explicit criteria and maybe some weighting of points, right? Uh, so that you can at least have, you know, some, something that's not completely subjective. It may not be completely objective because that's hard, mm -hmm. but at least you have some basis for saying, you know, this, this data set require, should, you know, even though it requires more resources, should get, you know, those resources because of this, right. this, and this, right? Right, right. And so uh, that's not explicit in this user scenario, that sort of, um, that triage, I guess you might want to call it. Um, and that might be something that, that we need to make a little bit more explicit uh, from efforts of, of a data advocate, you know, kind of assessing the actual risk of the data set. Yeah. Um, I think you know, that's the, uh, that's some, some of the data. value and, uh, you know, kind of the, 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 the return on investment proposition, you know, like how much is it going to cost us to do this yep. or like in time and effort versus the potential return on that value. Right. And so that's not necessarily explicit here, but it is very definitely something that we have been thinking about um, and, and talking about uh, how that gets built into this process. Yeah, well, that establishing, a, establishing a process to do that is probably the greatest challenge you have. Right, so and you, so, so, so I, you've you know, identified a potential user community, mm -hmm. uh, listed the stakeholders, You'll probably have to have representatives from each of those to take a look at uh, the data set and the condition it is in and the cost it takes to maintain it and mm -hmm. keep it and then give you an assessment. Uh, yeah, so um, that, that kind of a review process has to happen. But depending on the size of the job that you're trying to take on here, that, yeah. that, that review process itself may cost more than the data is worth. Okay. Right. Well, and so, so that, that, is, that is part of the, is, so some of these things can be done kind of um, in parallel with doing that, that assessment um, that, you know, kind of the, 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 the determination of, of how much effort is going to go into this data set. Um, you know, for example, you know, trying to figure out it, how much at risk, you know, looking at some of the work that, that um, you know, uh, the, the paper that, that Matt Miranek just, just recently published on assessing data at risk, um, you know, th there are things that, that we might, uh, you know, we may not be able to find an appropriate repository or, um, that that's going to be a, 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 an early thing. Maybe this stuff is already being done by somebody else. You know, this could be, you know, we're not closing submissions to, to anybody. You know, this could just be someone who heard about this data set potentially going away and so has submitted to us. Um, but maybe Noah already has plans to actually be doing all of this. Um, I just so want to point out, um, it is a, a few minutes past the end of the a session officially. So, um, you know, just happy to keep chatting about it. But this is really good content for, um, you know, when we dig into in, you know, half hour. Or so when we start digging into with the ad with the advocate path, um, what are some of these questions? Does a value assessment make the most sense? Does a risk analysis make the most sense? Does, um, you know, there's a couple of different ways we've been thinking about how what are the ways to evaluate data sets, um, which mm -hmm. at the end of the day is the role of the advocate um, in I, creating I, this project plan? I suspect the answer is probably something of all of the above, right? But the issue yeah. is the weighting of those things relative to, you know, um, a an actionable criteria, right? So you need right. some mapping between, you know, these sort of different dimensions, so to speak, of, you know, of quote unquote value plus risk plus, you know, these other sorts of things. And, and then, you know, what can actually be done, right, uh, within a reasonable, you know, cost frame, depending upon whether, what the nature of the, the underlying, you know, um, artifact that needs to be preserved is. Right? right, right. I think that makes sense. And I, I mean, again, this was a, this is a really complex scenario. Um, 
you know, in which there is a huge amount of risk and a huge amount of value associated with it. Um, whereas the one that we'll be starting with is um, uh, more typical for a um, early um, project when we don't have any of these um, processes formal, yeah. formalized. No, I, but I think that this makes sense to me from the perspective of you need a, you know, okay, so I'm, I'm going to go back to my uh, scientist's uh, hat, right? That, you know, you, you have some probability space here, right? Depending upon what people are going to start to submit to you, right? Um, and you need a sampling of that space, right? Of not just the, you know, if you have a bell curve, right? You don't want just the, the peak of that curve. You want some sampling of what the edges might look like, right? Um, and then you can create, you know, criteria based off of those. And so I think that having the variety of use cases is, is of great value because then you can start to see what the different criteria might be relative to those, those use cases. Right. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I dropped, I actually dropped a link to this user scenario into the chat. So you're welcome to, to look through this and, um, essentially make comments on that comments on it it's set so anyone who has the link can at least comment on this um and so I, the main reason i, I did want to go over this is to to bring up this kind of discussion where you know we're trying to think about everything that needs to go into it um and i like i said if, if you guys want to go take your take a 20 minute break and come back at, at the top of the hour that's great. I'll probably hang out in here. I'm going to stop my uh, screen sharing, I think. Um, okay. But I, it's like I'm welcome to, to, I'm willing to hang out here. Um, and, and, but hopefully everybody will come back at the top of the hour if you, if you want to duck out for a little bit and stretch your legs and get something to drink and all that. Yeah. In any case, we will walk through how we actually got to that document. And in the advocacy track, if we have two, or in the regular track, otherwise. But these comments that we've been getting are exactly the reason why we're here. So, um, good job, all. <laughs> yeah, I, I I have some things to add, but if, if we're doing a break, then maybe I can just get a word in when we when we start. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yes, we are taking a break. We're supposed to have a half hour, but we only have twenty minutes. Okay. Right. And I, I, and I got up in the middle of the last one at one point to take my break. So. Oh. <laughs> I'm willing to hang out here if, if anybody wants okay, to. Okay, well, I'm going to disappear for 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, I'll um, be back. I may wander off and grab my cat or something. But <laughs> okay. Denise, do you want the recording to stay active during the break, or do you want to pause? Uh, let's, let's go ahead and pause it. Yeah. Okay. You're very quiet. Can other people hear me? No, I can't. Yeah, you're fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can yeah. hear. Hear both okay. of you. Okay. I could not hear Denise. You sound quieter than us. In fact, I can't hear any of you. Hmm, weird. Okay. Try muting yourself and unmuting. Or Disconnecting your headphones and then reconnecting. Depends on how it works. <clears throat> Ruth, is it possible you muted your whole computer? And somebody, somebody came and started talking to you earlier. Oh. Now I think I can't hear you at all, Ruth. I, I saw your mouth move. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Okay, good. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine now. Okay, glitch in the Whatever. matrix. Um, yes. Dan Keys, I think we're, you've got us live streaming now? Live streaming and I just started the Zoom recording again. Excellent, thank you so much. So welcome back to those who uh, returned and welcome to the um, new people who have come in. Um, I think it looks like we have two new people, uh, Stephanie and Elizabeth. 
Um, if Ruth and Katie can verify that for me. <laughs> I think that's correct. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, 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 welcome to part two um, of our workshop uh, on uh, data conservancy in action, um, engaging the community with, in the data at, at risk data commons. Um, you know, the first half of the, the session was uh, some background about the motivation behind uh, data at risk.org and the data commons and a little bit of an introduction to what we're hoping to accomplish um, in this, in this uh, second half. Um, just as a reminder, uh, you know, by participating in an ESIT space, you have agreed to abide by the community participation guidelines. Um, there is a link uh, to those guidelines as well as um, a link to how to report if something uh, doesn't go right um, uh, at the top of our notes document. Um, so let's see, our, our plan was uh, originally we were going to split into two groups based on the two roles that we were uh, exploring with our data at risk uh, project. Um, but with a small enough group, I think we had thought we might all stay together. But before we start doing that, um, like to have uh, um, the new folks uh, give a brief introduction uh, of themselves, uh, your name, where, uh, where you are, um, and uh, what interested you uh, potentially in coming to this session. Um, let's start with Stephanie. Hi everybody, I'm Stephanie. I'm the Director of Operations of the Research Data Alliance. I'm in Melbourne, Australia. So um, I actually did not know there was a part one of this workshop um, <laughs> because it's 6am in the morning. I probably wouldn't have been in part one even if I had known, sorry. Um, I'm well, here- I'm in pressure up now, so. <laughs> 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 I'm here for two reasons. One is because I'm interested in the topic, but I don't know much about it. I know there was a sort of research data alliance interest group around that topic that sort of, I'm not quite sure where that's at. But anyway, um, the other thing is, I'm <laughs> sorry? I'm involved with that. <laughs> yes, I know. I, I enjoyed your BOF session in Philadelphia, I think. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Anyway, um, secondly, I'm actually here to learn a bit from the way the ESIP meeting runs as such, because we'll be holding a virtual plenary in November and um, we, we're trying to work out things that work well and that we could maybe um, do in an RDA context as well. So I'm here sort of for that reason as well. All right, excellent. Um, uh, Amos had to step away for a minute. He, he hopes to reconnect later. Um, unfortunate. Uh, let's go with, um, actually, you know, we have such a small group. Um, let's do, let's go ahead and do everybody. So I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Denise Hills. I work for the Geological Survey of Alabama. Um, my background is in, uh, in geophysics. Uh, I mainly do research around um, energy, uh, geoscience energy related issues, including geologic carbon sequestration. My interest in um, uh, data conservation comes directly uh, from the fact that we don't actually have any data professionals at the, at the survey. Uh, so it is done mainly ad hoc and because I care a lot of it falls to me. Um, and particularly because a lot of the research projects I do are only possible because we have the legacy data um, around. And so we spend a lot of time doing data conservation and data rescue. Um, so uh, that's one of the reasons I'm here. And it's one of the reasons I'm involved with the uh, data at risk at work, um, at risk data commons project. Uh, so Katie, I'll let you go next. Sure. Hi. Um, we've got a fair amount of people that were not in the first session. So this is great. Um, it's almost like really two different sessions. Um, so to everybody who's just joining, um, I'm Katie Micah. Um, I'm also on the um, 
at Risk Data Commons team. And I am a librarian. I'm a data librarian at Harvard Library. I also work with the Institute of Quantitative Social Science on um, the Dataverse software product as um, part of the data curation team there. So I'm interested in at-risk data and rescuing data because I'm a librarian and it fits nicely in with our ethical imperatives. <laughs> All right, uh, Ruth, you're next. Okay, my name is Ruth Dewar. I'm with the uh, Ronan Institute for Independent Scholarship, but I've worked on many and varied um, NASA missions over the years. I was at the NSIDC uh, um, National Snow and Ice Data Center um, for uh, 15, 16, something like that years. And before that, I was at the Alaska SAR facility, which is now the Alaska Satis Satellite Facility. And so I've been involved with data for a long time. And I am indeed uh, in a, a member of the at-risk data commons. In fact, I may have started the tool activity. Um, but in any case, that's enough. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Zach? Hi, I'm Zachary Robbins. I'm a PhD student at North Carolina State University. And I'm also the community fellow for the Community Resilience Cluster, where we think a lot about how to get data in the hands of people um, that can make decisions as to how to increase different community resilience ideas. Um, my connection to data at risk is a little uh, amorphous. I'm very interested in I deal with data that is lost a lot. And so I would like to prevent that from happening. There's a lot of forest service data for these big programs we funded around entomology and stuff like that. And that data is just nowhere that you can find it. It's in an office probably somewhere. So I'd like to get involved in maybe saving some of that data. Great, great. Glad to have you on board. Uh, Alexa? Hi, I'm Alexis. I'm also a community fellow. I'm a community fellow with the Data Stewardship Committee. Um, I am currently a grad student at George Mason University, and I'm starting my PhD this fall at Tufts. Um, and I'm really interested in physical objects, particularly related to ecological work um, and how that interacts with museum collections um, and long-term phenology, ecological sampling, and how we can better rescue and present that data. Great. Um, Elizabeth? Hi, I'm Liz. Um, I'm with the Kentucky Geological Survey, and a lot of what uh, Denise was saying kind of resonates with me. Um, so I'm trying to start a collection management program for our survey. I'm the archivist manager for our research library, and then um, working on a digital data working group, trying to get data management plans and kind of incorporated in daily tasks. Um, but, and I've co-PI'd and PI'd on several uh, data <coughs> specimen rescue projects. So this is right at my alley. So. Yeah, Liz, we'll, we're gonna talk later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've run into each other before, but yeah, no, we're definitely going to talk more later. Oh, pa good, good, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, who have I missed? Uh, Chuck. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Chuck Vardaman. I am a uh, research assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame um, in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering and a um, computational scientist in uh, Notre Dame Center for Research Computing. So I work on cyber infrastructure. Uh, my background is actually in theoretical chemistry. Uh, but uh, when I came to the center, one of the, my research interests sort of shifted a little bit into how we connect data and models together. And so I sort of wandered to the quote unquote wrong side of the tracks, I guess, and, and formal semantics. Um, so looking at ontologies, ontology design patterns for connecting uh, data to models. Um, so I'm active in uh, the various semantic clusters in, in ESEP. Um, I'm a co-PI of a Cyber Infrastructure Center of Excellent Pilot, um, which is a essentially an NSF-funded effort to look like look at what um, a center of excellence to support NSF large facilities would look like. Um, so this is a collaboration between USC, Notre Dame, 
uh, Utah uh, and Renzi. Uh, although now we have some folks at IU um, and trusted uh, CI there. And so my interest obviously is is how we start to um, you know percolate some of the these d data you know techniques into um, the large facility cyber infrastructure so that some of this stuff gets baked in. Um, so uh, one of the, the the you know the reason I'm here other than uh, Ruth mentioned that it would be nice if I if I came uh, <laughs> is that uh, you know I think this is uh, you know um, a, a teachable moment for the large facilities in terms of you know, some of these facilities have been around for a long time and they all have data artifacts at risk. And so how do we start to uh, think about n not just, you know, uh, past artifacts in, in uh, you know, designing cyber infrastructure, but how we can maybe start to save some of these artifacts. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> all right. Uh, people keep moving around. I can't, I'm losing track of who's, who's gone, who hasn't. Uh, video? Uh, hi, this is Bedia. I'm from Ohio State University. I work at Bird Polar Center, so Cryosphere. My background is remote sensing, data science, geospatial science. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm interested in this field here. I mean, like in this session is, uh, you know, back in the day, you know, we had to take this classical, spatial data infrastructure. And I was in Europe that time and we kept keep learning about this thing that uh, Bill Clinton signed into law that, you know, every, all the data that is, you know, funded through public, you know, public money should be free for lobby, everything is free. So that kind of big mind to, hey, you know, US is a place to go. So I'm here learning everything. And then suddenly like, you know, three, four years back, things change right now with the data is not only free, but it's at risk. And I don't know, late 2016, so scientists are getting frantic, like what kind of data are we going to lose? And being at the forefront of research, using data all the time, you know, I'm kind of just to you know, I'm interested in the field. But even you know, like even the days were kind of franked in 2016, 17. You know, to do time is you need some smarts, and I think <laughs> we got lucky in that regard. So it's still there, but we cannot just take these things for granted. We need like a community, like the people talking about these things, supporting each other, and yeah, so that's my that's my goal here. Excellent. Glad to have you. Uh, Shannon? Hi, I'm Shannon Christofferson. I'm with the Arctic Institute of North America at the University of Calgary. I am their manager of data and information services, and I have a background in librarianship. And I'm really interested in data preservation and data rescue, and particularly in pulling data from bibliographic resources like uh, journal articles and books. Uh, Dan Fuka is our last participant. Dan, are you back yet? He sent a message that he's going to be back a little bit late. Okay. Guess he's not back yet. So I am going to pass this back to Katie and or Ruth to talk about what we're actually going to do for the next uh, hour and 15 minutes or so. Um, I would like to say that that um, I think we're going to stay in one room and that we're going to start off by going through the data advocates a path. Um, some of you may not know the data advocacy role because you weren't here earlier in the day. But the data at risk group is uh, an organization uh, that's building a tool to basically do a match.com for data. In other words, to match up people who have data needs with people who have data skills and can help with those needs mediated by data experts in the middle. And those three groups of users are the submitters, the advocates, and the data heroes. The data heroes are may very well be um, citizens who have some skills. Um, like they may know something about metadata or, or they may have a, be, be good at uh, OCRing uh, documentation or all sorts of skills. They may be a good programmer, for example. So, um, so that's what the roles are. 
And what we were planning to do today was validating our ideas about what the process for this should look like by actually working through a real example. And with that, I'm going to share my screen. And this is a real example, really. <laughs> Um, it is Dan Fuca's example, and I'm about to show you the very first email that I got. I, for this particular part of the process, I'm going to be the data advocate who just received the first communication on the subject. So um, hold on just a second while I get the right screen up. All right. So. So the very first email I got was this. Howdy, Ruth. Most of the data centers with reliable futures are very structure dependent. What would you recommend for a place for us to stick real time updating data for which we're not certain of the structure? Basically, Elastic is the best database so far for this. But is there a free place with a reliable future that warehouses no DB Elastic Lucene type data? So what I would like to ask this community is, is what would you do if you got such an email? Um, or if this came as, as a submission and you're a data advocate for the at-risk data commons and it's your job to help people with their data needs. What would you do next? Any thoughts from anybody? Feel free to speak up, put it in chat. I don't care where you put it. Mm -hmm. I just would like a little audience participation. <laughs> Do you want my honest reaction, initial reaction? Sure. I'd cry. <laughs> no, I wouldn't cry. No, but <laughs> it, it would be, wow, I'm glad he reached, I'm glad this person reached out. Let's see what we can find. Um, okay. But, <laughs> Any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I might have some more questions based. I mean, this email is is very specific to a set of technologies, right? So he's thinking in terms of using Elasticsearch and, or Lucene to do the indexing of the underlying data sets, right? But he hasn't said much about that the, you know, yeah, these are, you know, uh, uh, sort of loose, you know, structured um, data that's going to be uploaded to this thing, but that there's not much more information there, right? And so, you know, doing an assessment as to the correct location and everything else that this may need to go, I think I would probably formulate a, an additional set of questions that, okay, well, you're not certain of the structure, but you're certain of the theme, the thematics of it. Um, you're certain of some other sorts of things, maybe. So what, what things can you tell us about it? And, you know, what is the raw data structure that you're thinking about uh, as being transferred? Um, and then talk about, well, why Elasticsearch and Lucene for doing the indexing, right? So. Okay. So I hope actually Zach and Alexis or both of them are taking good notes here because good feedback. So this is what I actually did. Um, and nobody noticed that I said first contact. Jeez, nobody's here is, is a trekkie. I got it. I just didn't react. Fine. <laughs> I reacted on camera, but you didn't see it, I guess. OK. No, so, no encouragement there. That's the, that's the theme. <laughs> all right, fine. OK, so while you've talked about data format, this is my email back to him. You haven't talked about data content. Content. What discipline? Hydrology? In other words, I was trying to get him to give me a little bit more information because I had no clue what he was talking about yet. <laughs> I mean, I know what the technologies are, but what is the data? And this is his response. Data is cost domain. Geo, hydro, geodesy, atmosphere, bio, insect sounds, locations, types, animal sciences, ag, ag management, and community sensing, your stuff. Basically everything but space science. Granted, scratch that, space science as well. So that tells you the range of disciplines that might be in it. And Shannon, I see your note. 
Yes, I agree with you completely. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Oh. Um, so, so now what would you do? Any, any thoughts? Okay, well, I'll just tell you what I did. Is it even specific to a region? They don't even... No, he's, this is all I had, okay? This is all. Huh? Literally all. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and we're going to rescue this today, okay? Yes. Oh, and Dan is back. Okay. By the way. <laughs> In case you didn't know, this, this, this communication is between Dan and Ruth, and it is a, a really good simulation of it's not a simulation it's well, no, no. It, it is a good uh example of the type of interactions and process we're probably going to be going through um, right we start accepting submissions right so at this point yeah now i know that there's lots of different kinds of stuff i don't know when or where or anything about that but i can at least ask the next question of him which is huh that doesn't really sound like a single data set to me, rather like a bunch of data sets possibly munged into a single Lucene elastic search instance. Am I understanding anything here correctly? And his response was written right there. A single <laughs> sensing unit might be sending different combinations of data and indeed each sensor on the unit might send at different times. So in reality, each sensor becomes a space unit. A horse, for example, sends motion, location, and temperature, along with the base GPS SNRs for each satellite. Also in the field would be a weather station configuration and gas sensors scattered about possibly soil moisture, stream flow, you name it. Basically anything, yet multiple studies for which in the future the data would be combined. Unstructured everything. So it's a neon unit, is that what you're saying? <laughs> no. Uh, we'll, we'll eventually get there. So any comments? What would you do next? Do we know where uh, they're from? It sounds like it might be a research station. Um, I know where he's from. Yep. And, and you're right. There is a research station involved, sort of, kind of, a little I bit. Would, I would ask for a meeting and see if I can sort of find out more in, in talking to the person. And... Um, I would also want to know a little bit more about what the purpose of that data set is. Why is it being collected? Right. Okay. So this is what I did. Yep. Each sensor platform, the doohickey and the horse is a data set collection and each independent stream of data is its own data set. An answer I know you won't like. So the problem is not that it's unstructured, but rather that it is multiply structured. But in real, but really, if each differently formatted sensor stream isn't separately characterized, there's no way folks will be able to combine data from these and other sensors in the future. And seriously, Elastic may characterize itself as being schema-less, but in reality, all the content is available as JSON objects, so not really. So yes, I was indeed getting ready to try and ask questions. So at this point, he came back, indeed to all. So where would you suggest we start sending data to? It would be really nice if it was elastic because they have a really nice log stash thing that allows you to rip through server logs for data. As most Apache server logs keep logs of get post, any server anywhere becomes a temporary holding. NCAR, for example, archives all their logs, just have to make friends with the system admins eventually. And my response was pick a domain or two, and then I can tell you a technology is not something any repository would subscribe to since all technologies change at least every few years. And at that point, he requested a contact. And and we set up a telecon. But, he, you know, he basically basically saying possibly we can meet and you can help me set the level of documentation that I should put into a file. It uses both Grok patterns as well as Ruby regex and the second due to Grok not having the capability to perform multi-repeated pattern matching. And so with that, 
we set up a series of telecons. And during that series of telecons, we created um, the documentation that, um, oh shoot, where's the link to it? Ah, okay. Um, that's in the uh, agenda. It's called VT Smart Farms Full Instrument Design and Data Flow Workshop, which is something that um, I'd like to give everybody a few minutes to read um, because it's sort of the knowledge of what's happening with this data set and is what we would then use to come up with, well, so what needs to happen to this data set? For those of you not in the agenda, I did just drop the link into the chat as well. So um, why don't you uh, put a thumbs up when you're done reading it? I expect we'll have lots of uh, comments or, or questions, um, but put a thumbs up so we know that we should restart, um, you know, the session. So take a few minutes to read. Thank you. We have a check mark and a thumb. Both are acceptable. <laughs> yep, you can also drop it in chat uh, because thumbs up goes away pretty quickly. <laughs> I think we have three more people.
Okay, is there anybody who needs more time? Okay, well, in that case, I guess we'll uh, continue on. So, given what you've just read, what are your thoughts? Ruth, did you want to share your screen again? Do you have more to share or are you done with that? Uh, I'm done with that. This okay. is just a conversation. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah. So any thoughts? Let us not have a priority type discussion because we at uh, uh, the at risk data comments decided that this would be a good case for us to use as one of our use cases. So, but, so if this is now what you have, uh, what you have is a, um, okay, I suppose we can screen share that. Um, uh, actually, I don't have all the links to all of the bits and pieces. Um, it's in our notes, I think. Um, all right, so I'm going to open up the several documents. Um, and then share my screen. And we can switch back and forth between them. And I'll move this over here. Share screen. Okay, so this was the document that um, you were all just reading and you can see the full list of uh, participants or leads of that um, workshop. And this is sort of when the data was acquired and where it happened. Um, this is sort of the purpose of that workshop, which is to basically demonstrate, you know, that you can build low cost, easy to build things that can be locally deployed and monitored for various environmental conditions. And in this bigger case, there were basically three types of sensors built weather sensors, which had temperature, humidity, and air pressure, air pressure, soil moisture, and animal behavior sensors, basically just tracking the movement of horses. And in general, the core of each sensor was the same. And, and the difference is really whether or not it had soil moisture. And there were a couple of uh, visualizations for the data that you could actually go look at if you wanted to. Um, I'm not going to do that. Um, but here is where the data was acquired. I think there's a little further down. No, I guess, yeah, it's not there. You can actually see the position of every data point. Uh, but there's a fixed weather sensor up here that was continuously sending data. These instruments were built right here. I, I presume everybody can see my cursor, right? Yep. Okay, good. Okay, the instruments were built right there. Um, this is a um, uh, horse barn where the horses that got centered <laughs> tended to be, and especially during a demonstration that they had. And then there's this paddock thing around here um, one of the visualizations uh, links up above, actually, if you um, uh, look at it, and I guess I will open it up, um, actually allows you to see where each of the data points were, maybe it'll load. Yay. I'll 
blow this one up and zoom in a lot. Okay, so here you can see really clearly see the paddock, the barn, where the stuff was built, um, the weather station, which theoretically is fixed, but you notice that it has some slop in the area, which um, I've heard explained as being due to precipitation. And then people were also walking up and down roads and things like that out and about. So that's where all the data was. The data itself, now I can't see my, okay, uh, looks like that. This is it. And if you're looking in the, um, in this document, there is a description of how to read, um, read each of those um, records. So the, the, the part that is data, in other words, these are really just log, or, uh, logs um, from your uh, web server logs. But the data part of it is, is between these quotes, basically. Um, you know, get, get VT sensor. And it is formatted like this. So here's the string that is the data. And um, and basically you parse the fields by looking at um, these values. RSSI equals minus 85, which is right here, um, is the signal strength from the low rod transceiver. Um, C, A through Z is uh, a soil capacitance sensor. So C, A, da, da, da. C, B is, uh, this one doesn't have a C, B, I don't see. Um, but if there were two, you get two. Um, relative, R, H is relative humidity. So basically the string here can be um, parsed. Um, and at this point, they don't have a mechanism to distinguish between separate um, sensors um, for relative humidity. Obviously, they should do something like RHA, RHB, or something like that. But that wasn't there this time around. Um, pressure in Pascal. So this entire string can be parsed out into its various components, temperature, pressure, humidity, et cetera. And that's true with both of them. And you see that mapping here in the document. So um, given that, you know, you know what the data is now and how to parse each individual string, what steps do you think need to be done to prepare this data then for um, ingest, in this case, into the Dataverse system? Thoughts? I'm what not that familiar to... with the Dataverse system. What, what does Dataverse need? Uh, Katie, that would be uh, something for you to answer. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a little, um, I, I don't know that we're going to have time to kind of, um, you know, go through the tasks step, step by step, which one of which would be, you know, deposit in, you know, in our case, we chose Harvard Dataverse because I'm very familiar with it. Um, but essentially, there are some curation steps that will have to be taken for these data um in order to de deposit in any dataverse uh or sorry in any repository um so you know 
it might be helpful to kind of take a look at the um, use case template, Ruth, um, to sort of that, go that through and see what are the thing, what are the questions we need to ask of these data in order to, um, you know, get a better handle of it. How can we write those down? And then um, what are the, after we have a, after we know a bit more about the data, you know, would it be appropriate to just dump the, this file into a repository? Is there any other type of activity that has to happen to the data itself? Um, does it need its own metadata file or, you know, in a lot of repositories, just depositing data will have um, a form associated with the deposit process that you can sort of outline some basic metadata for. So, um, a, you know, these are the types of questions that we are sort of hoping to kind of needle through in this process of um, advocates investigating right. a bit more. But there was a hand up. Um, yeah, I think Shannon, Shannon had a hand up. Shannon had her hand up. Do you still have your question, Shannon? Um, it wasn't a question. It was a comment. And it was related to Ruth's question on what we needed to do without knowing Dataverse specifically. I would want to know I would want that information that they provided um, put into a metadata document. And it really depends, but they might need to pull out some of that individual information and put it in to a, a form or something. So like all, um, those, all those little pieces in the string, can it go in completely like that just all bunched together like that or does it need to be pulled so, apart so a question i have for you or actually anybody is what would be most useful for your average researcher who's looking for things like temperature pressure and humidity over uh what was this kentucky um and, would, and that's why I didn't want to see it in that giant long string of junk. I'd prefer that their individual parts be pulled out and put into something that makes more sense. Um, mm -hmm. But would you keep the raw data as well? Well, you have to. Um, sorry, uh, that's my digital archives. You always keep the raw data as it is. Mm -hmm. right, answer. right answer. So far, you're three for three. Yeah. Uh, Chuck also has his hand up. Okay, Chuck, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I so part of the, the Cyber Infrastructure Center of Excellence part of me would also want to know, you know, as far as scoping, you know, is this a, so what is, you're wanting to preserve this, right? And so when is this going away? Um, what is the, or is there some future timeline of this that you want to continue to archive, you know, the, the, the data from these sensors, right? Um, you know, is there a longer term solution and a shorter term, term solution of, okay, this is what you've given us now, but can we migrate you to something that's more manageable? I mean, there's technologies out there like MQTT, um, even Kafka combined with MQTT, sensor things, which is an OGC standard, which would then, you know, give you some quality of service plus, uh, you know, give you some structure on top of everything else, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that there's, you know, um, you know, I, I, if this was like a one-off experiment, we did a high school class, you know, this is the end of it. This uh, MySQL server is going away in, in a month and, and this is, this is the data and this is it. Right. Then I think that's one thing. I think it's another thing if, you know, um, you're, you're, you know, taking something and saying, okay, this is sort of a one-off, but we're going to try to grow this project and there's going to be continuing things, right? Um, and yeah. that also would then determine the amount of effort that you'd want to spend, you know, you'd want to sort of, I think, a quick thing to, to bridge the gap between the current, you know, sort of state of the data and where you'd like it to be and where it's going to be at. And then I think there's probably a, a longer term discussion of please don't keep sending us log files. There's other things that you can do that will make this more usable by other people. And then we should talk about where that should go. Right. Well, okay. So to some extent, I think you're 
talking about, you know, making it accessible and usable to other communities through tooling, which is not really the mission here today. First, we've got to get it saved. Secondly, um, it is true that in this particular case, the whole goal is to get these really low cost sensors um, to be, you know, turn into lesson plans and things like that for for any community who thinks, oh, I have bad water quality. Oh, I have bad air quality. But there's only one, you know, um, sensor from the US government anywhere near my place. I need something closer <laughs> and and I want them to use it. <laughs> so so I think there is sort of more of a long term goal here. And in fact, we have another data set that we may use for this same kind of a workshop in September, I believe it is, mm -hmm. depending on what the SGCI group does, um, whether it's virtual or in person or what. It, I think it, if it's not, if it's not virtual, I probably won't attend. <laughs> but anyway, um, so yes, those are all good questions, but from a data preservation standpoint, which Sa Shannon was suggesting is that three of the steps are, one, get the raw data archived, two, transform the raw data into a form that is more usable by, um, you know, people who just want spreadsheets of temperature, pressure, and humidity or whatever. <laughs> Basically, um, anyone not familiar with the original data set. Right. Exactly. And then in both those cases, you need to have some sort of metadata and documentation that conforms to some set of standards, preferably community standards. So the, those would be what I would consider the big three that probably have tasks associated with them because you can probably parse them out a little bit further than that particularly the metadata and documentation one. So Katie, do you want to talk through what you actually had here? I believe this um, is- Sure, yeah. Um, let me- Do you want me to stop sharing? Yeah, do you mind if I share it instead? Please. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Great. Um, okay, so we came up with, um, we've been using a template for use cases that looks a little bit like this that we went through in the last session. Um, and so this is a bit more of a filled out template that I kind of um, built a little bit in order to facilitate um, potentially executing some of these tasks and then getting over to the dataverse side of this, but it doesn't look like we will have quite enough time to do that. Um, but I think it does get to the heart of what the advocate's role is. And it would be um, sort of helpful to, to hear from the group if um, after we go through this, um, if it made sense, the leaps that I take to get to here make sense in the context of what we've been discussing so far. Um, so that's really, I think a, would be a productive discussion um, following this. So if, if you're the type of person that helps to have goals in mind, um, that's one. So, um, right, so here's a project plan. It is not as robust as say a processing plan would be for an archives, um, but it does kind of ask a couple of the same initial questions. It does depend on an initial scan of the data and understanding of the documentation that um, Ruth has gone through a little bit already. Um, so in the first section of this project description, um, you know, it, it, it's helpful to outline a bit of context for where these data came from. Um, so they came out of a workshop that happened in May of 2019. Um, the, the purpose was to demonstrate sort of this development and deployment of very low cost sensors um, that could be built by anybody really. Um, in this case, targeted towards students and citizen scientists. Um, so the sensors were built um, and then they started, you know, picking up some data, which is terrific. 
Um, so then a, a quick overview of kind of what is available. Um, again, this project plan will kind of live on the data at risk.org platform to kind of give a sense of, you know, an overview of what the data are, what work needs to happen um, before you kind of have to dig into anything off of the, off of the system, I guess. Um, so this data description gives you a bit of an example of, or a bit of information about these data are, you know, currently stored here. It's helpful to kind of write that down to really get um, a handle, a brief description of um, what the existing scenario looks like, what we're actually looking at, what we actually have. Um, it's helpful to know where exactly the files are stored um, because, you know, to ex execute some of these tasks, we'll need to have those data. <laughs> um, whoever, whichever data hero kind of goes in and does any of these curation steps that come up, um, will need access to all this information. So it's helpful to know where they live. Um, in here, there is, you know, the original storage locations of, you know, the submitter kind of has them um, probably on a personal computer or a hard drive. It's probably co-located with wherever this database lives, um, but it might not be. So that could be a question to kind of take back to the submitter and say, is this important to know? Um, anything like that. Um, there is some limited documentation available. Um, the data centers are not currently live. So they're not currently producing data. Um, and so the data that we have is in fact complete um, from the workshop days. In order to, it'd be nice to kind of consider, you know, were these to sort of become operational again, what would that, what would that mean for um, this project, for these data specifically, and for um, any future data archiving? Um, there's a simple kind of description of what the data are. They're, you know, at the very basic, there's text strings um, that have, that contain raw output from the sensors. Um, and then we just put everything on Google Drive. So um, there's a link to the drive folder that has all the data and the documentation in it. And that's what you know, we probably anticipate people are going to be heavily relying on a lot of um, systems like Google Drive and um, other open, simple, collaborative uh, tools to sort of share data back and forth. Um, one thing, you know, that's useful to hear from, especially anybody that has experience sort of doing community, community management and volunteer management in these types of, you know, contexts, I guess, is, you know, the point of data at risk is to not be a data repository, not be a place where, or a platform where a lot of this activity is actually taking place, but to coordinate it. Um, and so we're, I think, having a bit of a struggle figuring out how to communicate that effectively and how to make that um, clear in these workflows um, that we're imagining. So um, some feedback on that could be, could be really interesting to discuss also. Um, as far as stakeholders go, scientists, citizen scientists, policymakers, teachers, environmentalists, um, you know, a lot of people that could be interested in these types of data. So that's another way to consider um, what needs to happen to these data um, for policymakers, for, um, you know, uh, citizen scientists or, you know, your average researcher that wants to have um, a better understanding of climate data, of um, you know things like that, it, it might be worth considering. Um, you know, folks may not have, end users may not have um, the skills or the desire or the bandwidth to do data cleaning and data transforming. So, um, in the next piece, we think about what does that mean for a success outcome. Um, so, in our you know, super successful end condition, data are transformed into tabular data that have clear variable names that are very easy to understand and use. Um, in a minimal acceptable outcome, the raw data are deposited in a data repository with a bit of documentation. And it might be what are the available variables that are included in, the, in these strings, um, or that would be kind of some essential documentation, but um, you know, thinking about, Yes, it would be great to get some data transformed, but if it's not possible, then you know, depositing the raw data at the very least is going to be useful um, to have, you know, rescued or archived. Um, documentation files are created, which really, in this case, means a lot of um, going back through that documentation we already have, 
um, thinking about how to format it so it's um, easy to read, easy to understand. Um, looking at those variable names that have been added to that documentation and seeing if they do in fact match up. Um, depositing the data and their documentation in, you know, we we chose Harvard Dataverse, but it, there's are, there are a number of general generalist repositories or domain repositories that could be more appropriate for this for these data. Um, we want to make sure they have some metadata that they are have licenses applied to them and that there are terms of use available. Um, and, you know, it will be interesting to kind of consider asking the submitter, you know, are there any other supplemental supplemental material that you haven't given us? Is there a poster from anything? Is there, um, you know, are there any visualizations that you've created that might be of interest? Um, going back one more time and making sure that if there's any other supplemental material, it could be useful to keep that with the data itself also. Um, so as far as tasks go, um, again, we're splitting these up so individuals can, users of the, data at risk.org platform can kind of come in, review what things have to happen to this data, see if they can kind of pick away at a few of them, um, you know, finish up some documentation, clean up some documentation, write a quick script to um, transform these data. Um, or if someone really wants to kind of take a little bit of ownership of it and understands the data repository and can kind of get something submitted um, at the end, that would be great too. Um, so essentially, uh, oh, the last thing I wanted to note is that um, as part of this task, you know, thinking through why it's important to transform stuff brings up the case of how you transform it and creating some um, provenance information and contextual information for all of the steps that you took in adjusting or changing or transforming the data is essential to, you know, remain with this data package. Um, and so, you know, so a little bit of my background is in um, archives management. So this is a hat that I wear a lot um, and sort of thinking about what what contextual information is going to be essential for end users to understand this, this data. Um, okay, so in addition to the questions I kind of threw out there at the beginning, um, you know, it might be useful to talk about what, what else do we need to effectively um, curate it? What happens if, I mean, I guess as a colorary, what happens and what changes about this curation process if you can't obtain additional info? Um, so if you go through and start doing some data transformation, you run into a, a number of the value, like, you know, hundreds of, of values in a, in, a, in a single variable column just are not um, looking right. They, they actually have, you know, some characters in there that don't fit with the patterns that have already been identified. What do you do in those circumstances? Um, if you don't have access to the original submitter, um, when things like this trip you up, how, what would be a way to manage that in the context of this volunteer sort of, you know, individual level type of, um, you know, volunteer curation work? Um, another one we've been considering is whether it might be useful to have skills kind of listed or tagged on some of these tasks. So um, would, it, would it be helpful to kind of uh, select or self-identify with some skills and then either be po pointed towards tasks that you might be able to complete or um, you'd be able to select things based on some skills that you think you might have or be useful to see what skills it would take in order to do this. Um, similar things could be like how much time it might take, um, other sort of evaluations of the task itself that could be useful. Um, yeah, and then general feedback on the workshop, but I guess we'll save that for the very end. <laughs> So Stephanie, your question about uh, the workshop is, are you talking about the workshop where they built the sensors or the current workshop we're in? Sorry, the workshop where they built the sensors, because I thought if it's a school thing, I was wondering if they were doing this on an ongoing basis, which means you get an annual data set or something like, or annual set of data, if you like. 
and also if they did this in an ongoing way, it might be good to give them some feedback or some information on how, what, how they can document things as they go and then um, make it a bit easier to actually um, rescue the data or preserve the data. Uh, Dan, are you able to answer that or? I am and I actually threw a question in the, into the chat is, uh, the possibility of, and which is basically spot on to uh, the last comment, is something that I would add to this is uh, recommendations for the person that, or the group, that being me, um, uh, for if or when the sensors or the if another project, the data flow might come online again. So if there's scripts that are required to be run for the data to be put in uh, into Dataverse or whatever repository it's going into, what is the simplest, how do you make it as simple as possible with as the least amount of effort to do that? And Ruth and I have discussed that with this project specifically and going the next step to talk to Dataverse is, well, we already have this Apache log ripper and that can send data anywhere. So at least in the case of this project, it can um, automate a good portion of itself. In which case, what you're saying is that if we came up with a, a format for the uh, non-proprietary tabular format that perhaps there would be something that you could do to uh, create uh, scripts that created that and then you would have the raw data and then nicely formatted data as well and then on top of that it would be lovely if you actually created the standard format uh, metadata and then that would totally simplify this for uh, everybody so yeah we have some uh, we have suggested going on specifically in this project and anything else that that might be able to help out with uh, the various groups that are dealing with sensors now is a incorrectly ident uh, uh, identified as a micro decad um, but an ontology and a very very small means of identifying uh, different types of data um, similar to the way uh, uh, data used to be handled back in the 40s and 50s through radio. Um, at, which is, I think, Ruth, where you started uh, your discussion is finding those old NASA data sets that were extremely yes. and optimized. Though I, I should note that your data is simpler than that. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, that's useful. Yeah, this is Chuck. So that was sort of what I was alluding to earlier. Um, so that, you know, that, that that I think that's part of the 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 scoping process, right? You know, is this a a, you know, one off rescue mission or is there a possibility that this is an ongoing rescue mission, right? Um, and that also then leads into resources, right? So, you know, if it's an ongoing rescue mission and it may the rescue mission may in fact grow, then, you know, um, some repositories may be happy to take a, a limited scope of, of data, but there may be a more appropriate location uh, for, you know, there are data repositories for citizen science, right, where things may, may be more appropriate. So I think that also leads into the questions of, of you know, the final sort of resting places, um, you know, depending upon whether this is a one-off or it's a continuing sort of effort. Yeah, I think that's an interesting comment, especially because it in some cases it, it can be hard to know or um, if it's, yeah. you know, not ongoing because there is not a place to put it long term or there is an unclear right. method for so, this type of archiving then. So I think this is part of the the, you know, conversation, the human aspect of this is that in, you know, talking to the person saying, you know, um, that the context surrounding the request. Right. So in the case of the, 
you know, the old uh, photographs, you know, there it's the, yeah, we're, we're tearing down this building and it's going away in, in a month. And so, you know, we need a place to put the physical artifacts, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In which case that that's clearly, you know, one sort of use case, but the, you know, the, the, the other use cases where, well, we already have the digital objects there, you know, part of this project that's sort of more modern and ongoing and, and is using this set of technologies, then that's going to lead to a second workflow and a second set of decisions uh, and a second set of context, right? Um, the farther back you go, obviously, the, 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 the more, I think, context you probably need. Uh, which may or may not be available, right? So the, the NASA use case that you guys had was kind of really interesting in that, you know, there, even though you have the microfilm, the archival, you know, sorts of projects I'm aware of have actually, you know, in some cases gone back to, you know, identified programmers that were originally associated with the project and gone back and actually asked them questions, right? Um, so, you know, this, this idea of context and actually, because that's data in of itself, I think one of the questions in my mind is how do you capture that sort of information? Because that should also go in probably to the repository and part of the workflow, right? Yep, I agree. So I wanted to expand on Stephanie's uh, uh, point that uh, that part of this is iterative in which it, uh, for the future, it gives us the ability this type of workshop, expanding on it for uh, gives the ability to teach the next generation uh, how to more properly uh, exhibit their data uh, to the world. Is that, and uh, Stephanie, possibly you could expand on that. Yes, yeah, so I was just thinking <clears throat> it might be helpful if the students learned a bit about what they could do like for example give them a list of questions to answer about the data or make them come up of, with their own scenarios how the data could be used and things like that I mean get them early <laughs> it's never too early to sort of instill a bit of a sense of data management um, thinking in people I don't think so that was that was my thinking behind it because it sounds like a really good learning experience for the students and sort of the fact that it's not just about the technical data and how you capture that and what you do with it but also things around what would people want to do with this data and how can you make sure that people understand what the data is about i think that's a that's a really good combination of things for students to learn and Ruth, possibly you could expand just slightly uh, uh or fill in the gaps where this project actually started was it doesn't have any it's not trying to solve any type of scientific question rather it stemmed off of trying to educate uh, data scientists uh, because so many di data scientists are now removed from the sensors that they don't actually understand it so it, it started with a workshop that was in that, that, that no, we held in Hawaii that uh, uh, allowed for just saying, hey, you data scientist, you AI person, you machine learning person, you build a sensor and deploy it in this, in a jungle or in a desert or in one of the uh, uh, ecosystems that we had access to. So this was actually initiated off of a educating AI people and data scientists as to what sensors actually produce. One question that came up first when we were going through the planning document um, in the ethical considerations question section, um, it, this is data that sounds like it was collected in an educational setting um, and taking appropriate care with geolocality information of children is something that I think is really critical. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure if it's completely problematic in this case, but other citizen science data sets where you do have locality information and knowledge that the people collecting the data are underage um, is pretty, I think something that needs to be considered. And one of the things that that sort of brings up is I was wondering whether there's a plan to have some sort of guidance for the 
um, advocates or for the helpers, because some things like it's very clear, like, oh, we shouldn't share someone's medical information, but other things I think can be more challenging and a nuance to know whether it is an ethical violation to share or warehouse this kind of data. Um, so and sometimes that- there's even questions in the field about what is and is not an ethical mm-hmm. violation. Right. Yeah, I think definitely documentation is the next big thing to tackle once we have a functional product, um, I guess. So I I think that a lot of this will be, in fact, quite unusable without um, a really clear set of guidelines or um, standards to point to for, you know, working through a lot of these processes and there there is really high quality documentation out there that we can point to um as far as the ethical questions go that is one place where i think that there is a lack of really high quality um general guidance so um it's a really interesting thing to bring up and really important and so variable um but i'm i'm really glad that you brought it up is essentially what i'm trying to say um, Ruth and Katie, this might be something that we include. I know we're trying to make it as simple as possible on that submitter side of things, but we might want to ask if they know of any potential ethical um, conflicts um, in addition to having robust documentation and such. Actually, uh, I think we do already. Awesome. Um, But the points that uh, Alexis are making are are well taken. Um, For example, I don't know that we have people currently in our group who um, would have thought necessarily of the student issue. Um, Because I know a lot of citizen science projects actually haven't thought of that or thought that whole thing through yet. so, so that's a hint, Alexis. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's something I'm working a lot on right now with iNaturalist data. It's really horrifying. I can figure out where a lot of students collecting data live, where they go to school, where they spend a lot of their time. And I think that's a big problem. Um, I think we spend a lot of time thinking about protection of the things we're sampling and less about the people doing the sampling. Um, but that's also of concern with like indigenous communities and such. It's a it's a big deal there. So and and in fact, um, you know, the whole concept of whose data is it is becomes much more nuanced. I guess you would say. So yeah, yes. I think you really pointed out sort of the beauty that we're trying to kind of capture in um, collaborative efforts like this. I mean, there's just so many ways to curate a data set and getting a lot of eyes on it from different perspectives, I think gives us much better insights onto, I mean, ethical issues, absolutely, but also um, things like who are stakeholders, what actually is useful for different groups of people, how are different groups of people using data? Um, I think it's a really powerful way to accomplish some of this if we can figure out all of this nightmare of, um, you know, coordination, I think you, I think sort of it's demonstrating that there is a lot of um, opportunity here for really high quality um, outputs. So I see that Chuck has his hand up. Yeah. Um, So sort of related to that, you know, I, I can imagine scenarios also where the person who is requesting that you rescue some data may not always have, uh, you know, clear, quote unquote, legal right to the data or legal access, right? So I can think of, so an example, right? I'm a chemist. So, I mean, back in the day, we had some old spark stations that were, you know, essentially collecting NMR spectra, right? Um, And most of those went to research projects, which were probably NSF funded and open source. But I can imagine a scenario where there was some sort of a research contract with some pharmaceutical company. And so if I just dump the NMR and say, hey, you know, there's a bunch of NMR in here, which, you know, may be useful uh, data to extract out. 
um, you know, the, 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 there would be maybe some missing context, right? And so you may actually need, you know, the chairman of the department or someone with some actual, you know, institutional authority to say, yeah, this is, this is okay if you extract the information out or no, we, 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 we don't know, you know, that all of the information is, is, uh, accessible. So that may be one other consideration that, that you, you, you may have to, to bring to the table. So. Uh, uh, totally agreed. And in fact, in um, in the 30 stream flow, we actually talked, we, ha we had the data advocate talking to the, the knuckle location where the data currently was, and then to their parent organization as yeah. well, just for those kinds of reasons. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, if there's one message that I'm trying to get across here is that a David advocate's job is not something that can be done in 30 seconds by somebody with no brains. <laughs> no, and, and particularly no guidance, right? And right. the other thing is, is that um, I would also recommend capturing outflow of the data advocates because, I mean, oh, yeah. as the data advocates go and they get more, you know, quote unquote, samples of types of data that need to be rescued, all of that information needs to feed back in the system to improve sort of the guidance documents, you know, the sort of the workflows of those people mm -hmm. uh, based upon the lessons that they're learning as they're going. That's indeed true. And, and it is one of the reasons why we have a history table, which I guess you okay. call a provenance record for, in other words, we want to know exactly what happened to each of these, you know, everything, the, oh. the uh, submit, yeah. original submission got split up into these tasks for these reasons, this task yeah. had these things happen to it along the way, that kind of thing. That and maybe a debriefing, right? So, yeah. you know, those sorts of things may not capture as much. A, I mean, it, it adds work to probably you guys, but I think that, you know, a conversation, debriefing conversation can probably get at more of these than maybe an automated sort of questionnaire. You know, at, at, in the beginning, it's probably not that more, much work if this actually takes off and you have, and hopefully it does, uh, you know, you may have lots of volunteers to, to do this and it may become more difficult, so you have to do some sampling of it. But I think that that might be a useful thing, at least at the beginning, uh, be able to get a handle on, on how well things are working. Yeah. Right. Yep. So. And I note that Stephanie talked about licensing and um, yes, actually, uh, Katie's um, uh, plan for this particular data set did have licensing in the tasking list. Mm -hmm. So yes, that is very important. The one would like to think that things were quote open, but yeah. in reality. Yeah, so uh, kind of related, it's not just, you know, kind of the licensing of our output, but what is, is there any licensing consideration on the data that's coming in as well. Um, is someone tr you know trying to save some data that has some license that means that you can't? Um, but, uh, but so yeah, I, I added kind of both aspects of that in um, the, the additional questions for data evaluation. I added that question after I saw your comment, Stephanie. So you didn't miss it. It wasn't there. <laughs> so. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think um, it's at the end of the day, I think we're going to have to default to some things because unfortunately we will absolutely run into issues where it is not possible to find an applicable existing license um, and you know, at what point do you assume it's open? At what point do you assume it's yeah. um, copyright? And I think it's just going to have to be, I think evaluating that and trying to figure out there will be some edge cases and um, it's absolutely going to. The one thing I'm worried about is becoming an LLC and um, then becoming liable for applying open licenses onto proprietary data yeah so. that that was actually my concern <laughs> in bringing up what i did was that you don't necessarily have you know shielding um that you know um mm -hmm. a, a a government project quote unquote might have or know, some other sort of, of situation right so yeah 
Um, I think that's and, and the a major question is issue down the, line. the liability for repositories, right? So the, it's not just the fact that you guys are taking. In fact, you're probably less less <laughs> less in, in Dutch than you know necessarily a, a the final resting home for for an artifact, right? So and depending upon how they're releasing it. So yeah, I mean, I can I can speak a little bit towards how um, the Harvard Dataverse manages that, and I and I am. I, I know that there's a number of other data repositories that if they are open and they allow anyone to submit something, then there is, you know, it does require some kind of license or, you know, Harvard Dataverse applies CC0 licenses by default, but then does have some legal protection in that's, you know, in which it states Harvard and the, um, you know, owner IQSS, the owner of the repository platform is not, you know, release is released from um, the liability of these licensing issues and it goes to the user that deposits the data. So in cases like this, it would remain, you know, our responsibility to deal with those licensing issues. A number of open repositories just pass it on to the user, which is pretty common for a lot of um, online systems like this. Mm -hmm. I, these are definitely, I, I would separate them in uh, the two major topics. One is how do you protect the kids uh, or the property owners or the places where the data is uh, collecting data uh, from how do you, uh, the other protections. The other protections, you do an LLC underneath a partnership and that means that the only thing that really can go away and disappear is uh, the power for a couple of minutes while they reset the uh, the data centers, um, but I would the it's pretty easy to remove ourselves from damages other than or the data centers from damages on that level, I believe, other than anyone can sue for anything. Right. Yeah, I mean, I was sort of thinking along the lines also of the physical artifacts, right? So it's not just that it sounds like that you're you're going to have, you know, uh, uh, digital artifacts within the scope, but also potentially physical artifacts, or at least for short periods of time, having physical artifacts while they're being transformed to some digital uh, preservation uh, structure, right? So assuming that, you know, there was absolutely no way that you could keep the original. Um, so you know, that, that also may have different, you know, um, sets of issues with it. Um, mainly because digital artifacts, if you're a content provider has certain protections, right? I mean, it's the reason why Google images, you know, or whatever, if I publish something that's copyrighted online, you know, they're, they're a provider, right? So there's protections in that. That's why you can sort of pass these along, right? Uh, I don't know that those exist for physical things, right? So, no, I mean, actually, that does come. That that's a really real um, circumstance that I have actual personal experience with because um, this photographic collection had um, some living people and some that died while we were trying to get um, the licensing and stuff with them figured out. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it can be a can of worms. It, 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 it indeed can be, but you have to know about that in advance. But I do know we're three minutes from the end of this session wow. and we should, um, actually figure out what our three takeaways are <laughs> and, and do our wrap up. Uh, stuff that we're supposed to do. I sincerely hope everybody who is here will, you know, like our session. <laughs> mm -hmm. They have a feedback button. We would take feedback if you think there are um, other ways we could do this sort of work or ways to approve these kinds of sessions. We were a little bit surprised because we had 30 people sign up a bit. But actually, these have been about a dozen instead. Um, but um, I do think that this has been highly valuable. Yes, I certainly feel like it was useful as, as with what we're doing with um, data at risk. I would like to invite 
everybody who's who's here. Um, if you are interested in doing more work with us, we're always looking for more people to be involved. Um, we have we have a Google group email list. Um, you can reach out to me or Katie or Ruth, and we can get you on that. Um, and uh, yeah, we meet weekly. You don't have to show up every week. Show up when you can. Um, but we'd love more of your input um, because the greater the diversity of people that we have involved in the development of this, the more robust it is. Um, because just in the session today, certainly topics came up that we hadn't necessarily thought about, or at least we'd, or we'd thought about, but not at the right point in the process. Um, so I very much feel like I got a lot out of this. No, I think it's been a very good session. Um, even if we didn't get to actually submit your data to Dataverse, Daniel, we didn't quite get there, but we could have. <laughs> well, I think I think the important uh, the, and the most important part is the back to back to the submitter of the data or the, uh, the source of the data uh, for, uh, to actually work through the uh, nuances of continuing the data uh, feed and what what continuing the data feed actually means for the nuances mm -hmm. like the best way to say it anyways we are planning and doing another one of these workshops again in september so if you have suggestions please make them so we make the next one better mm -hmm. yeah i'd just like to echo everybody's sentiments so far thank you for joining and your great comments um I hope you were able to take away something good from this. I know we did, and I hope it wasn't too one-sided. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot. And with that, I think our session is over. Actually, mm -hmm. we're over a minute by. Um, and feel free to, to write in what you think some of the takeaways are. Um, I know that we'll be looking, I know Ruth and I and Katie will probably look at that as well. Uh, but sometimes the participants see a different takeaway than the uh, than the organizers. So I really appreciate everybody's time. And